right, welcome to another episode of Reptile Fight Club. Thanks for uh, joining us. I'm Justin Julander, your host, and with me, as always, uh, Chuck Bowman. What's going hey, on? Hey, yo! <laughs> oh, not much. How are you? <laughs> Doing all right. Yeah, I can't complain. Um, nice. We've got nice. A, a special guest from down under today, so Mitchell Hodgson. Uh, did I pronounce that right? Let's see. Um, uh, yeah, that was pretty good. Yeah, uh, okay. I, I can't complain, girls. So well done. <laughs> <laughs> Most Welcome people might not overdo the e. Or <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you, guys. It's always thanks a fun challenge really, trying. Really keen to be. Yeah, fun challenge trying to you know get all the schedules aligned, especially when you're uh, you know half the planet away. So, yeah, thanks for uh, making the time. Yeah, no, thanks again, and yeah, it's um, a good reason to get up nice and early on a Sunday morning here. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what everybody likes to do, nice. right? Get up early on Sunday morning. <laughs> all right, feel like you achieve something in a day, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's another you know another thing why I can't sleep in is I just feel like I'm wasting a weekend. You know, like if I sleep mm. half the day on a Saturday, it's like oh man, it's already over and now I got to go back to work. So I don't know. I like to maximize. It's weird time. though. As I get older, my mind says yes, but my body <laughs> <Yeah>. says no. <laughs> oh man, it's it's fun getting old. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Well, what's uh, what's going on uh, reptile wise? You guys having any? Uh, I guess you're you're kind of on the on the downside of the season, right? Uh, in Australia, Mitchell. <laughs> uh, oh no! Well, mine's still going. Yeah. I guess ballistic, for lack of a better term. <laughs> I um I've sort of intentionally uh, what's, the, what's the best way of, sort of saying it? Like I sort of not wrapped up, but I've definitely scaled back the amount of things I'm intentionally breeding. Yeah. So I've still like I've got lots of animals that I um. Like I'm keeping as pets and, you know, it's still like animals that just want to hang around and things like that. Um, but I haven't actually been intentionally breeding, but I've had a lot of things that have bred, um, either like particularly geckos. So I've had, um, uh, golden tail geckos, Cistrophurus, mm-hmm. um, some Boyd's forest dragons, um, nice. Oedura geckos, like a heap of geckos that haven't actually incubated, but they've hatched in the tank. And so I found oh. babies running around. Oh yeah. So That's... I've been dealing, <laughs> I've been dealing with a lot of those unexpected things because I was like, Oh, I knew she was grabbing, but I thought the eggs would have just gone, yeah. you know, gone off. But, um, they're hatching yeah, in the so cage. That's a good quite... sign of a good cage, a good enclosure, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's been great. Especially yeah. the, um, uh, the golden tails. I've, yeah. I've had, four, I've had four so far hatch out in there. Oh, wow. Um, and same with the boids of, I literally had no idea that the eggs for the boids were viable. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have a small hole in, or had a small hole, I should say, in the top of the cage. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I found this baby boids running across the floor in the room where the <laughs> tank is. So I was like, Hmm, where did that come from? So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, but no, other That's than that, cool. I had a few live bearers that I knew were going to go as well. So cunning hams and yeah. life old skinks. So yeah, it's been, it's like, I used to breed a lot more, but just with work and like, um, particularly, I guess, trying to find, like, I don't have the time to find good homes for stuff, so I just don't intentionally breed it anymore. Yeah. Yeah, that's, um, a, that's a tricky it's thing. too much of a challenge. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, we're, we're kind of facing the same thing here with, uh, you know, we, we always have those market fluctuations of, you know, when times get tight and people aren't spending their extra money on reptiles, you know, they're spending it on food or <laughs> gas, you know, you don't, don't have much of a choice. You just kind of have to scale back or, or keep, you know, the stuff you have, but I don't know. That's why I've kind of kept a, you know, more of a small scale, you know, hobbyist breeder type thing rather than uh, going professional or something, whatever. But yeah, it's a, a trick. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's all scales right as well. Like it's uh, a lot of people in Australia, like the U S is just, you know, it blows me away when we sort of see the scale of stuff you guys have going over there because your small scale is like, and I'm not saying you particularly, yeah, but yeah. just generally sure. U S small scale is like, <laughs> you know, a commercial breeder in Australia. Yeah. You know? like, yeah. That's it's true. Just so different. Yeah. But yeah, we've got <laughs> what, 10, 10 times the population. And so, you know, that's, that makes a big difference if you have a limited uh, pool of people who are interested in buying. And, you know, I think, uh, I, you know, I, I think around the world, reptiles are ra- rising in popularity as as pets, and more households are keeping reptiles, which is which is exciting, you know. Because I like, I, I don't know, I it, you always hear at reptile shows, you know, oh, I'd love to keep a snake, but my mom or my dad won't let me, and they're afraid of it, and so I think that's kind of diminishing a little. And now you hear more <laughs> kids being uh-huh. able to get those pets and be able to keep them, so it's kind of cool. 
Well, as I say, I was very much like my uh, my mum was very anti snakes, uh, like very. Um, I, she sort of had like regional upbringing, like she's from the city, but had lived regionally and stuff. Mm-hmm. And you know that attitude in Australia is very anti snake. You know, yeah. like the classic. She wasn't a strong any snake. Oh, the only good snake's a dead snake, which is a pretty common yeah. expression here in Australia. I don't know if it is in the US, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but she definitely was anti snake. And uh, eventually, after however many lizards she's like maybe and then i just bought the snake anyway yeah um <laughs> it's a legless um, lizard and after actually yeah exactly like um and just after having this diamond python that you know once it got too big to hide um <laughs> i sort of put it in like a center part of the house yeah. um just walking past it every day like totally sort of i guess broke down those barriers you know like seeing it's not a psychotic killing machine that's just trying to kill you every three minutes yep. um i think particularly with like all of the outreach stuff on social media and Things like that. Like we have a lot of these really good snake ID groups where people, you know, from all these areas where they've got these terrible ideas about snakes, put up a photo and then, you know, like a ridiculously dedicated team of admins will actually ID, give them information, walk them through. Like it's all leading to positive change across the board. So that's cool. Um, yeah. It's nice to see that, you know, people like reptiles like us <laughs> or more people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Well, that's, yeah, it's, hopefully it, it keeps going up and we see more and more people getting into it. And, you know, I think the attitudes of kind of that, uh, everybody needs to be a big time breeder changing a little bit as well. People realize, you know, I don't need to necessarily do this This is my full time job and maybe I keep it as a hobby. And I, we talked about that last week a bit, you know, like uh, staying yeah. small or two weeks ago, whatever, when is what, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I just, I, I enjoy, you know, breeding and seeing the babies hatch out and kind of the challenge of getting them going and stuff like that. So keeps, keeps life interesting when you're working with reptiles, but I've also got my room so I can keep everything if nobody's buying or if I'm a lazy advertiser, which I most certainly am. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, I feel you there. Yeah. I, um, <laughs> I literally go through runs where I'm like, okay, time to sit down one evening and put up all the things that I just haven't been bothered to put up. Yeah. And then when you put up 20 ads, yeah. you get 200 responses, you know, and then you're like, yeah. which one is which? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Know, like, Wait, have I sold that one? I don't know. Where, where am I? Yeah. And it's like, oh, how much is the, or, you know, do you still have the dragon for sale? And it's like, which dragon? Yeah. There's eight ads up. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. And I feel like, I feel like the multitude of questions are, are other things that come with just one ad adds like multiple layers yeah. underneath just mm. one person inquiring about one ad and then you get 200. So you yeah. really have like 700 <laughs> different things you have to do off of, <laughs> you know, off of 200 people. Yeah. Yeah. That, maybe that's why I don't <laughs> post many ads, but <laughs> sorry guys. Um, yeah, we're, <laughs> we're kind of in the, in the, uh, breeding stage right now. It's, uh, winter here. So it's, you know, nice and cold outside. We've been getting a lot of snow lately. So that's been Have you? nice. Oh, yeah. Been skiing, oh yeah. I went up boarding last night. It was, it was beautiful. Nice. Like just floating across that powder, you know, it's a great, great feeling, but, um, so we're, I, I saw a pair of pygmy pythons log, locked up, uh, couple of days ago. So that was uh, encouraging. I missed, missed on those last year. And, uh, so we'll see, see how they go this year, but I've got a couple females paired up. So we'll see how you have, goes. you had two clutches the year prior though, right? Yeah. Or, yeah. or, or a clutch, at least a clutch, la- not last year, but the year before. Yeah. And then the year before that as well. That's right. right. Yeah. When we moved into so the, you've been pretty, yeah, the new, the new house was really good for, for that first year. But then second year, I don't know if I, I, I probably left them too warm during the breeding season. And so they just didn't get that cooling or stimulation or yeah. whatever. So I uh, changed things up a little and it looks like it's doing something. Maybe all the storms too, you know, storms rolling mm-hmm. through, uh, promoting that mm-hmm. breeding activity. But, um, saw a few, you know, stimsons and, and Western stems, Eastern stems, you know, locked up. So. Yeah, things are moving in the right direction. Uh, the blackhead female looks like she's gravid. I, I think she's ovulated. Nice. We got eggs on the way, so <laughs> hopefully I, I can do better with them this year. I've been chatting with a few Australian friends trying to figure out you know what I'm doing wrong and how to how to improve my success rate there. So hopefully we can get more blackheads uh, hatched out. Do you feel like you've made some, some gains as far as what to do different or I, I think so. I think one of the big things was putting the male in earlier where she's ovulating mm-hmm. so early in the, mm-hmm. you know, in the, 
in the season. Like, you just had your you just had your timing off. Yeah, yeah. And I think that was a big part of it to get you know good viable strong eggs. And then the other part's just working out my incubation you know mo- mm-hmm. mechanism. That's that's a challenge. I mean, I don't know. Maybe Australians don't seem to have a problem with that. I don't know if there's some inbreeding depression yeah, going I on, mean, but yeah, it's we have a hard time hatching them out. I can't remember it's blackheads. I know one of the, I might be blackheads or worms. I'm not so full credit. I <laughs> yeah. have only ever bred snakes once uh-huh. and I've bred brown tree snakes. It's the only uh-huh. thing I've bred or ever invested interest in to try and breed snake wise. Uh-huh. Lizards is usually yeah, my you're a lizard man. But, hey, but, <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, with the Aspidotes, I'm pretty sure a lot of people do like drier incubation. I always remember that mm-hmm. being something that people talk about here all the time. And yet, yeah. yeah. Um, and like that being a big trick is like, you know, if you do it too wet, they just don't go or they get moldy. Well, you know, some people, I remember, I vaguely even remember someone not even putting any water in, like maybe yeah. a splash of water or something once mm-hmm. and having viable eggs. Um, whether that's a, you know, N of one, right? Like yeah. <laughs> maybe they just have a lucky collection that could survive anything, you know, you can, they still hatch out. Yeah. Um, but uh, <laughs> yeah, no, they seem like they, you definitely hear people have, um, I would say issues, but certainly from what I've seen, blackheads are a more tricky one here still. Yeah. Once people get the eggs, they seem like they go okay, but mm-hmm. um, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, that's one of the big changes I'm making is you know drier incubation and um, less less ventilation, things like that. But then, of course, later in incubation, you know, making sure the humidity isn't too like oh. airing them out every day and things like that towards the end. So, see if that works. <laughs> But yeah, cool. Yeah, well, good luck, dude. Nice. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Fingers crossed. Yep. Uh, I'm, she looks like she's gonna dump a bunch of eggs, or um, I mean, she looks full. I I haven't really. She yeah, looks pretty good. Yeah. yeah. I I did uh, cool. chat with uh, one of the uh, herpetology professors up on campus. She uh, Su- Susanna Fran. She's really doing some cool research on you know island uh, iguanas. Some of the um like the oh. Caribbean Island iguanas. So some cool stuff there. And, uh, but she's, I, I went and chatted with her in her office about, uh, um, ultrasound equipment and trying to figure oh, out yeah. maybe I could, you know, pick something up, but she's like, Oh yeah, come bring a snake in. You can use our stuff anytime you want and <laughs> yeah, all that kind of stuff. So see if, cool. see how easy it is, see how, you know, cause I don't know. It's one, you know, one more thing to add and where we're, you know, yeah. we're all busy and got other stuff. And, you know, am I really going to use it if I bought an ultrasound? So it's, it's probably good to do a test drive, see, see if I can do that. But I, I think it's worth it. I just, I like the idea of scientifically just kind of tracking things and, you know, kind of having, mm. having an understanding of what's going your on. Brain, you know? Your brain can't resist <laughs> yeah, that. Exactly. But, yeah. but then again, I have, too, yeah, I have a lot it's of too stat sig for you, bro. <laughs> there you go. I have a lot of ideas and, and, you know, some, not much follow through, <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm here to enjoy these things. I don't want to be tracking all this data, but then at the same time, I'm like, I want to collect the data so I can make graphs and charts. I don't know. So it's kind of a, Two way thing, I guess. That's, nothing wrong with yeah. a little spitball in. <laughs> there you go. But it would be it would be fun. Uh, first hand data for the complete Aspidites. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> there you go. Uh, right. <laughs> hmm. That that might be uh, forthcoming. We'll see. <laughs> it's a uh, business expense. Yeah, exactly. There you go. Yeah. Well and yeah, that's that's obviously like, you know, the, the, the idea is uh, not having to pay taxes on the money I'm making from the reptile. So buying uh, stuff <laughs> through the business or going over to Australia. That's uh, how I like to spend that <laughs> business money. So research exactly, purposes. Exactly. You gotta <laughs> you gotta, you know, see him in the wild to be an expert or whatever. So, yeah, but cool. So you're in uh, Sydney, right? Sydney area or? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I, um, yeah. yeah. At the moment I'm actually down in our nation's capital, Canberra, oh, cool. but, um, okay. generally, generally I am in Sydney. Yeah. Yep. Gotcha. That's a cool, cool spot. You know, I, I've, uh, done a little bit. Uh, I, I spent some time up with, uh, Peter Birch in, in uh, oh, Arimba yeah. and stuff and, on the central coast. Yeah. 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 It's, uh, it's a, cool um, place. cool, like Sydney's good, especially herping. Well, mm-hmm. depends when you've grown up here and seen a lot of stuff, you kind of get tired of it, but yeah. Sydney's <laughs> great in the sense that like, once you get across the Hawkesbury river, which is the sort of big river North of Sydney, which is where Peter is on the rim bar, mm-hmm. you start to get all these Northern, not Northern, but like the sort of mid North coast species start to creep in. So you see angleheads yeah. and then you get a bunch of different, like, um, a species usually sort of start picking up there. So you get like, 
Um, on the Central Coast, you get rough scale snakes, you get Stevens banded snakes, all these really cool sort of a lapids. While in Sydney, you get, you know, things like the Broadhead, which is a Sydney endemic. Like, mm. it's just a nice sort of little melting pot of a lot of cool herbs. Yeah. Not to say that other regions aren't, but like, there's certainly worst places to be. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's for sure. Uh, I guess anywhere in Australia seems uh, pretty nice right now, especially I, I wouldn't mind uh, getting over there soon, but I, we've got a, a trip planned in, uh, for June to go look for green trees. So middle of the oh, winter, yeah, yeah. Perfect time I guess it. that's an, an okay time to go up there and check them out, you know, b- before the, it gets too dry and not, but it's not too wet to get up there. So yeah, I was going to say, you know, I get stuck there in the wet. Yeah, I mean, exactly. supposedly like I've, I haven't done like Cape York, but you hear people are um, trying to rush out before the, the rains come because they want to get stuck up there. So yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I, 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 I went, uh, 2010 was the last time I've been up there. So good, you know, 13 years ago. So I'm excited to get back up there. And I was very happy to hear that a lot of the road is sealed now rather than uh, dirt road. So <laughs> I'm excited about that. Cause that's a, a rough drive from Cairns uh, up North. So that should be fun. Yeah. But, cool. Well, it gets to revisit areas and uh, see where they find the resealed roads. I've done, um, <laughs> For work, I've been out to Western New South Wales a couple of times, uh-huh. and progressively, one of the big roads out there has become more and more sealed. And it's like, yeah. thank God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yep. I I was uh, fascinated by the half sealed roads where you're like driving along, and all of a sudden it goes. Oh, yeah, it's like on off. Yeah. On, off or or it goes yeah. down to one lane, and you're driving this one lane, and and all of a sudden the car's coming towards you, and you're like. Wait, what do, what do we do? You know, what's the protocol here? I, I didn't, I don't know about these roads. And, and then I see the car go kind of one wheel off the sealed part. And so I go one wheel off and we pass each other. And then I see a truck coming. So I go one wheel off and he's not doing one wheel off. I'm like, oh, <laughs> yeah, you just yeah. plow through. Like you get out of the oh, way if it's a truck. Are both wheels off. <laughs> exactly. <Got it>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, you get out of the way. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's, I bet they don't even slow down. Huh? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, and and you know, being used to driving on the right side of the road, not the correct side necessarily, but the the right yeah. side. Yeah, and then having to switch over to the left, especially if it's a dirt road. You know, I yeah. I've, so is 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 when it goes you know, paved or sealed, unsealed, like, is it sketchy? Like you're driving at speed and then all of a sudden you're like, Oh my gosh, <laughs> it's dirt. Yeah. You know? Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. it can, it can be a little, yeah, pretty, pretty dangerous if you're not paying attention. I could I definitely see if you, you know, yeah. had different moist soils or something mm. like that where you're like, Whoa. yeah, I almost got caught in a river, uh, doing one of the crossings, uh, up towards Iron nice. Range. And, so uh, like it goes like right through a river. Yeah. Yeah. So you're driving on a dirt oh, road yeah. and then all of a sudden the dirt roads going through a riverbed and, and, and I, you know, I haven't done a lot of riverbed crossings in a vehicle. And so I'm, I'm starting in yeah. like, I got three guys screaming different things at me, speed up, <laughs> slow down. No, go this way. I'm like, Oh crap. So I start getting bogged down a little and I barely made it, you know, get across and I'm like, okay, I'm done. I'm out. <laughs> Somebody else drives. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Turn it over oh, to I, Alan um, Rapashi. <laughs> he's a driver. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. He's a driver. A thing where we were out herping in, um, like sort of northwestern New South Wales, but that exact sort of thing where it was like, this road looks good, and there'd been a lot of rain in the area, so we turned down this road, and it had kind of just turned to slush. Like, uh, it looked fine, but yeah. the road just, like, no traction, and the car was Like, as soon as your everywhere. tires got into it, you're, you're yeah, done. Yeah, and it was kind of like, as soon as there was some traction, it was, and we're going to do a U-turn now, <laughs> yeah. and then we're going to go all the way back. <laughs> yeah. you know, it's just... It's yeah. like everyone just be quiet. We're gonna get there, but be quiet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 quiet everyone. <laughs> yeah, we we were out in the, the middle of Western Australia, just like on this dirt road. Um, where were we going? We were going from like Newman over to um, some mining town with a strange name. But anyway, we it's it's dirt road, and all of a sudden we come to this place, and it's just water, mud, you know, across the the whole road. And, uh, I was like, and we were in like this hippie van, you know, no, no, no great four wheel drive or anything. So all of a sudden we see this mining truck coming the other way. So we're like, Oh good. You know, we can kind of cross. And if we get stuck, there's somebody here to help us. Cause we hadn't seen anybody else on this road. And so we start to get going and they just plow through, like just whip past us. No, don't even wave, you know, just gone. And we're like, 
oh, I guess we're not going to have help if we get stuck. So, and we, uh, we, we kind of went around, went around, it went through the mud and it was okay. We made it through, but I was like, oh crap, now we're going to get stuck, you know, be out. That was a clear message. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, I got a, You're on your own. got some fun, yeah, car stories out in the middle, <laughs> out, out in the middle of the outback, which are, yeah, it's always. I was cool. say, <laughs> if that's a, oh, sorry, go, go, go. Oh no, I was just gonna say I do feel like you know uh, us Americans, Westerners, are very spoiled because yeah. you know. I guess there are parts of the United States where it's pretty isolated if your car breaks down, but I mean, literally, like. In Australia, I feel like you have to be able to solve your own fucking problems <laughs> in the middle of fucking nowhere. So, like, preparedness and being able to do things is important. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, and that's yeah, not my not, self, that's not my wheelhouse. I don't know much about cars. Self rescue, yeah, man. exactly. Self rescue. <laughs> yeah, get out the YouTube and look up how to do something. But yeah, that's about it. Yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm anxious to get back over there. I, I love your country. It's good stuff. It's a good spot, hey? I mean, it's one of those things, right, a lot of Australians, and I think actually a lot of people don't take it for granted, but really, like, um, and I know I guess it's probably more of a herp to culture rather than herping and yeah. herp to fauna in general, but, mm-hmm. like, you know, we have some pretty damn amazing stuff here. Like, you know, I'm, I'm a big deserts person. Like, I absolutely love the deserts and just the diversity of things we have in our deserts. Yeah. Uh, amazing and you know just the land the diversity of landscapes we have right like yeah. we've got we've got alpine regions like where i am at the moment sort of the start of our alpine regional mm-hmm. alpine region people <laughs> listening can't see my air quotations but like you know <laughs> yeah it's not like uh, uh overseas but then we've got you know these wonderful deserts the tropics tropical or tropical rainforest tropical yeah. savanna subtropical rainforest and you have all these different amazing species that fill all these different niches so uh-huh. yeah um yeah we've got some cool stuff here yeah yeah, I'd say heaven on earth is in the Pilbara. That's that's my favorite spot. Mm. Karajini. Oh man, that was that was a little surprising to hear. Like going over and seeing some of these things, and then finding out that my good friends in Australia haven't seen those or haven't been to that spot. And you're like, what? You live here? Just fly over to Western <laughs> Australia. Just go do it. You know, go see it. And I, I think that's it's a real uh, that's here too. Trap, right? Yeah. You're like I'll do it one day. Yeah. You know, I can do it one day, yeah. and yeah. Then you just never do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think. Uh, you know, Chuck and I and, and some of our friends have been getting into more regional, you know, herping here with COVID and shutting everything down. It's like, maybe we should check out the stuff in our own backyard. You know, I haven't seen all these species that are a state away. And here I am trying to fly to Australia to tick off all their you know species. And so, yeah, it's been a lot of fun getting out into Arizona or Cal- uh, California and seeing. There's them. nothing wrong with that either. Yeah, Let's yeah, yeah. be honest. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Like, <laughs> yeah. But. Dude, uh, Walk into bubble gum, okay, folks. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I, I guess the the answer is get out and herp, regardless of where you are or where you're going. Just get, get out and see nature and see the things you're keeping in boxes, and you know, so you don't think everything comes from a deli cup or something. But yeah, I mean, it's I think, really like changing, right? Like, I know everyone mm-hmm. talks about it, but like when you actually, and I mean, so when I started. Um, my herp sort of path was very much like I got into keeping. I just had the, uh, I saw like a TV show or something where they talked about like um, reptiles as pets. And then also the other thing we can have here, are a few native mice species mm-hmm. in my state. Yeah. So like in state by state, as I'm sure everyone's probably yeah. aware, like Australia's regulations vary considerably from all manner of different sort of parts, but in my state, at least New South Wales, you can only keep two native mice species. Mm-hmm. And so I was interested in getting these mice and a lizard. And I ended up going to like a sort of backyard pet shop thing and getting both of them and sort of mm-hmm. diving off the deep end from there. But I went probably like four, four years of keeping before I even like actually cared about seeing anything in the wild. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, I started slowly seeing things and, um, that was when I sort of like, like really got into my PhD and was looking for one species in particular. Mm-hmm. Um, and then from there, um, I got into a bunch of different work and things like that and started seeing all these different species and seeing things I'd kept and, you know, things that I would, was considering keeping. And it just changes your whole perspective, like how you set them up, what actually interests you. Like after seeing certain species in the wild, um, I was like, wow, these are like a, and I, you know, it'll differ from person to person. Right. But like, mm-hmm. There are certain things that I would never have considered being good captives that I'm like, wow, I'd love to actually keep this one day. And then, you know, there are certain dream species here that people keep that I personally 
have kept and think of the most miserable species I've kept. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's kind of like, you know, you only know until you've kept it. But, yeah. um, yeah, I think seeing a lot of the stuff in the wild, um, really changes your perspective on what you want to keep and everything like that. And I know people go on about it, but I don't know. It's a really good motivation for people to go out and see it and actually evaluate, you know, do I want to keep this? How do I want to keep this? Et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Great ones. Um, Luke from, uh, the Aussie Herd podcast, yep. like mm-hmm. his perspective changed entirely yeah. when he found the wild gillens, you know? Uh-huh. And you talk about everyone that was on that, that herb trip and when they sort of talk about like where the gillens was in the tree, how big the tree was, yeah. you know, all the dimensions, how hot the tree was on the inside versus the outside, like all these different aspects. It's kind of like, you know, it re, uh, rejigged the passion for the species, but B, you know, gave you a lot of thoughts about how he should be keeping it, you know, and I think that's probably the next stage of herb keeping, right? Like it's not just buying a new species to feel that I want something new in my life. It's changing around a tank or doing something to make it more fun. You know what I mean? Like we're changing yeah. our tact, I think collectively as a community. Yeah. But yeah. It's encouraging to see that too, that movement towards, mm-hmm. you know, bigger caging more. I mean, you're, you're a great example. If you're hatching out things in the environment, you know, in the, in the enclosure, that's a, a good sign of a well set up environment. And, uh, you know, that's what we should be shooting for and striving for is something that, that tricks them into thinking they're in, you know, in a, in a suitable environment to lay their eggs and have them hatch and things like that. So that's encouraging. And I mean, and also, I guess you rarely see that with academics where they, you know, they study the, the animals and also are good keepers. I, I was surprised, you know, reading uh, Rick Shine's book and seeing that he just didn't succeed much with keeping stuff in, in, uh, enclosures and things. So that was, uh, that was kind of funny to see, but yeah. I, um, so my current job is actually at, uh, Rick's old institution. So I'm currently oh. at the university he was based at, uh-huh. um, but um, and I work in another herb research group there, yeah. but, um, it's kind of cool. You've got like, uh, when Rick finished up there, he moved a lot of his stuff out. There's a lot of his legacy stuff that's still around. So like a lot of, um, the, they've got, we've got like old racking units that we yeah. use to maintain like babies of the lizards we work on. Sure. Um, but a lot of them have like the, um, we have like ID cards and ethics cards and things like that mm-hmm. from. Uh, like, you know, if you've got an animal in there, you need to identify and all that sort of stuff. But they're from a lot of Rick's old projects with, like, students. And um, there's, um, like, his old snake room where he used to keep all the snakes that he worked on. Um, you know, it's just cool seeing all these things where you're like, wow, this is the foundational stuff of a lot of things we read. You <laughs> right. Know, like- yeah. Yeah. <laughs> as far as uh, academics go, man, I don't know that anybody can touch his <laughs> track record and publication record. I mean, the guy is prolific and just did a lot of great things. And I, I love reading his a machine. His, yeah. Right. So I, I guess that would kind of bring us in. Let, let's have you introduce, you know, your, yourself and where you fit into herb culture and kind of. Uh, yes, yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. I realize we've tangent. No, very no, it's, it's um, great. It's no, been a great I discussion. Mean, yeah. I, I, <laughs> horrible tangenter and chatter. So <laughs> That's what we like yourself. here. <laughs> yeah. You're good, 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 com- good company. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, I've been keeping, I started keeping it, I think, 2014, somewhere around there. Um, and so, yeah, my main interest was primarily lizards. Um, and that was when I sort of had a lot more time, lived at home, had more disposable income, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I fell into, I guess, what I would call the trap a lot of people do where you rapidly balloon and buy everything you want. Um, <laughs> and you find a cage for it. And, yeah. you know, my perspectives changed a lot. Like I still sort of use basically a very similar space, but mm-hmm. I have a lot less animals and a lot bigger cages and, um, I feel a lot happy about it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but I, I've kept more species than I really want to admit. Um, at least Australian species. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, yeah. So I, part of the reason as well, I thought I'd recommend the topic that we're going to chat about, um, was that I actually worked in uh, a pet shop throughout my PhD or pro to oh, and cool. throughout my PhD. Oh, wow. So I worked there for about five years. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, kind of saw a lot of, and I think this is something that the reptile community don't fully appreciate is the really clear distinction between or distinctions. It's almost like these boxes, right? Mm-hmm. You've got your commercial, at least in the U S we have them to a degree, but not the same, but like your commercial industrial massive breeder. Yeah. Um, you've got your hobbyist, which is probably where I'd peg yourself say justin like in that hobbyist thing where you're small batch breeding you know you've got your passion projects but there are things that are probably like viable financially and blah 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 but your focus is like your passion 
yeah. money is good on the side, but it's not like an industrial breeder where it's like a yeah. operation where, you know, everything needs to be a machine because you've got 10,000 snakes. Mm-hmm. Um, but then the final box that we usually totally neglect as a community is the pet keeper, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. and this is, you know, little Johnny who's going to get his first bearded dragon, his first, um, I guess our equivalent of your corn snake would be a children's python yeah. or anteresia. So yeah. that's like our common starter snake species for most people yeah. um, or Morelia. Um, but, you know, they're going to get their first python. They don't care about all of the crap. They don't care that it's a hit. They don't care any of that sort of stuff. If it's a pretty-looking marbled, they're like, that snake's pretty. Mm-hmm. If it's a pretty-looking T-positive, that snake's pretty. If it's a, you know, ugly-ass-looking spotted python that's brown and doesn't do anything and bites a lot, they don't want it, yeah. you know? It's all about, like, that individual animal that's going to be their pet that they're going to watch for the next 20 years, you know? like. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's something that a lot of people kind of neglect is that whole different perspective. And, you know, like for us as a keeper, you know, I don't know what the prices are in the U.S., but, like, people who want to do everything on a budget could set up a full snake, like, raising enclosure mm-hmm. for, like, 20 bucks sort of thing, you know, or yeah. like 30 bucks, you know? Yeah. If you're really cutting every corner, buying your heat mat or heat cord from, like, a dodgy importer, um, <laughs> all that sort of stuff. Yeah. But, like, you know, it's a whole different market where these people will invest a small fortune into raising this animal. So they'll buy a very fancy setup to go off the ball, and they're ready to, like, fully commit to this. Mm-hmm. And so it's sort of, like, experiencing that firsthand throughout, you know, this five-year period where I worked um, mm-hmm. at the shop. It just made me realize that, like, when uh, the community, the herb community go on about, like, oh, this is how this should be, or this is a great pet for people, or blah, 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 and also seeing how irresponsible some people that come in to get pets are, yeah. um, it just makes you realize that, like, I think people need to be better, especially, like, large-scale breeders who probably breed stuff and ultimately sell the pet shops. Mm-hmm. Um, and that certainly happens here in Australia, and I know it definitely happens in the U.S. You've got, like, a number of uh which is my wording here correctly, uh, not necessarily mills, but like, yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> large scale breeding yeah. operations. Let's go with mm-hmm. that. Um, where people are just totally disconnected from the animal, like the end product, you know, where the animal goes. Um, and so, yeah, it just got me out all this sort of perspective about like the pet industry and, mm-hmm. uh, what it means for our community. Cause it is a lifeblood, right? Like, if a herb keeper wants something, it's not going to happen. Like the pet industry doesn't care what hobbyists want. Yeah. If a pet keeper wants it, say, for instance, red bulbs, which have been thoroughly debunked now for several years for their use, but, you know, Mm -hmm. they're commercially viable, so they keep manufacturing the living hell out of them. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those things where they are the impetus behind a lot of innovation in our community, um, at least product-wise, market driving, all this sort of stuff, and us, you know, 20% at the top that, you know, love all these animals and are keeping all the freaky stuff, (laughs) don't give them the credit they're due. Or criticize them where it's required, which is kind of where the point of today's fight discussion comes in. <laughs> there you go. So, so quick, real quick, just, um, I, you know, so as far as like, um, you know, here, uh, a lot of our, our pet shops, I would say, you know, people like Justin and, and maybe myself who are like more small batch breeders, we do have quite a bit of, of, uh, you know, move through into those pet shops. A lot of what I see comes from guys who get stuff, breed stuff, and then sell it back to the pet shops, uh, just to kind of like, as a simple way to move animals. Is that, is that kind of the same or is it more of a, how does does it kind of work in where you're at? Again, it really differs, um, due to the States. So, Mm -hmm. uh, not only do we have different, um, legislation for what can be kept, how it needs to be kept, record keeping, etc. I shouldn't say legislation, uh, regulation um, between the different states. Um, we also have like varying degrees of uh, what pet shops can do. And so, mm-hmm. for instance, uh, or if they can operate. So, for instance, Tasmania, you can't commercially, like there's no commercial operation of live animal or live reptile sales down there. Mm-hmm. Their system is actually literally like you apply for a permit to go catch it from the bush and you can keep six of every species on that list. If you want to keep snakes, because those snakes they have down there are venomous, you got to do some extra loopholes. Mm-hmm. While, for instance, um, say South Australia um, is probably the loosest one. So South Australia has basically got like a um, prescriptive list. So they've got, or they've got an exempt list, so things that don't require mm-hmm. a license. 
They've got a basic list of things that are considered easy to keep, high numbers, not threatened in the wild. So you just pay your 50 bucks and you go get your license from the regulator and you can keep those species. They can all be sold in pet shops that have a basic approval. And then they've what's called the specialist list. And that includes every species you could get legally. So that specialist list, you know, if I, um, I don't know, I'm trying to think of something obscure, but like a, a white lead python. So we do have white lead pythons in Australia, um, or in the captive trade. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if I got a white lead python, that's not on any of those predefined lists. So I'd apply to the um, regulator and say, hello, this is my white lead python. This is its legal source. Could I please buy this snake? They give you your little permit. You go sweet and you go buy it. Um, but the thing with that is, is that their pet shops operate on a similar scheme. So, they can all sell, I think, exempt as long as they've got a pet shop license. Then they've got this basic list of, you know, uh, or this exempt list they can sell on the basic list with, like, bearded dragons, enteresia, um, morelia, blah, blah, blah. And then they can apply for the specialist, which means that they can, as long as they're approved as a pet shop with this specialist permit, they can sell anything. And so um, and I don't mean this in a bad way. It's just a comment on it. But we did have yeah. a pet shop down in the SA that was selling a Parenti. Mm-hmm. So, like, you know, you can rock out. And obviously, they would. I hope they would have exercised care in who they sold it to. But, <laughs> you know, like, you can rock up to a pet shop and buy a Parenti. Uh, again, because that regulation, they are on the, you know, you need a specialist permit to buy them. But, yeah. yeah. Um, well, here in New South Wales, we're only allowed not even 15 species in pet shops, but 15 taxa. Mm-hmm. So there's pretty strong rules gotcha. about um, They've actually cracked, or not cracked down, but like, for instance, um, carpet pythons, Mm -hmm. uh, when they brought the pet shop legislation in, they had huge fears that um, diamond pythons were just going to be wild caught from the bush relentlessly and laundered into pet shops. Mm -hmm. So they refused to license pet shops to sell diamond pythons. So New South Wales pet shops can sell Imbricata, so southwest uh, carpets, which are almost non-existent on the the East Coast. But we can't sell diamonds, which are one of the most common ones here. Mm -hmm. So um, it just comes down to sort of the, I wouldn't say the whims of regulators, but just, and Mm -hmm. the problem is, is the turnover time on these things, you know. These reviews and these things take decades to get going. Mm -hmm. um, And usually it's only a minute change. So, yeah, it really varies from rule to rule. But with all of that said, Coming back to your question, Chuck, because uh, yeah, I know yeah. it was a tangent, but I wanted to give the, the sort of <laughs> no, no, you, no. That's exactly uh, you, you just answered exactly what I was really driving at. Is is um, what? How does how does it kind of work for you guys? And so it varies quite a lot in the sense that in the um, so my state, usually there is a few bigger breeders that will supply pet shops, you know, or even small batch breeders that will supply pet shops. But that's because they can build a really good relationship because they can only sell Antaresia. So, you, mm-hmm. you know, you find people that can breed Antaresia in the numbers you want, in good quality, good health, disease-free, et cetera, et cetera. And so you work with these these people to, you know, get these animals in, arrangement, these people connected, blah, blah, blah. Um, same with bearded dragons, all that sort of stuff, like the typical uh, geckos. You know, they usually work on a small batch scheme. Now, in the other states being uh, South Australia and Queensland, and I don't know too much about NT's pet shop sector, nor WA's, Mm -hmm. they do have a larger list of species that can be sold in their pet shops and sort of more into the hobbyist territory rather than the the pet keeper territory. Mm -hmm. Um, And with that, I think there's less connection to the end user. There's probably like, you know, they they know the people they're buying off and they vet them and obviously make sure they're not going to get themselves in trouble from, you know, buying something illegal or buying something unwell. But because of the diversity of species they can buy, there's a lot more just buying anything from whoever's got whatever available. And that's just an observation of mine. Like, you know, uh, oh, there's five stores monitors available. I'll buy all five of them for my pet shop and then we'll be selling stores monitors next week. Oh, there's, you know, 30 OE Dura Marmorata available. Let's sell why we do a Marmorata this way. You know, yeah. like it just, it really comes down to what's available, them getting it in, mm-hmm. throwing a markup on it, selling the equipment, making their profit margin rather than having an ongoing professional relationship. Though some of them do. And I know certain yeah. pet shops in those states that do have ongoing relationships with people that breed strange animals, like not strange, but you know, more hobbyist species rather than mm-hmm, sure. what is your typical pet species. So, and, and one, uh, one last yeah. question that those specialty permits that allow people to sell, you know, kind of pretty much the, the, the uncommon or anything hard, hard to get, uh, for, for pet shops, uh, very scrutinized or, um, uh, so kind of- all of the pet shops have, uh, in all the states, from what I understand, and again, I'm most familiar with New South Wales, and I know a bit about the other ones. 
Um, there is scrutiny. So, and it depends where you draw the line at what is good scrutiny, but like for New South Wales, they have to sit a test. So the pet shop supplying have to get, do a test that sort of says, you know, we know the fundamentals and supposedly it really is just the raw fundamentals of like, you know, reptiles need heat, uh, you know, give them water. What are the rules? And we've got like, um, uh, a code of practice, which I don't know if you guys really have them in the U S I assume so, but like, basically it's a code of practice for how a pet shop needs to operate. And if you breach that code of practice, Mm. Uh, I should say with respect to reptiles. So this is, you know, the regulator, the environmental regulator with this code of practice. But, you know, minimum cage size for display, minimum housing requirements, minimum record keeping requirements, blah, blah, blah. Mm. If you breach these, you can be fined. Okay. Um, and then the pet shops here, again, in New South Wales, get audited a lot more frequently. So they actually have auditors that go through and make sure that everything's, you know, in a good standing animal welfare wise. Um, you know, they check the record books to make sure that the record keeping's at one point, yeah. all that sort of stuff. Um, so I wouldn't say it's um, hard to get them at least here. I think there is definitely a bit of a, a step up, and it's not something you can just get on a whim, and you can't just start up a reptile pet shop with no consideration here. And that license fee I've heard is like killer. The commercial license fee is killer in New South Wales. But um, there are checks and balances. But, you know, I think a bad operator could still sneak through ultimately. For the other states, um, I think you have to do a similar sort of thing where you've got to convince the regulator that you are competent in being mm-hmm. able to sell. Um, and so, for instance, like in the example I gave with the Parentes, I know having spoken to the people at that shop that they've got a permit that says open Varanid. So as long as they've legally acquired any Varanid, they can legally sell it wow. um, to someone with an appropriate license to own that Varanid. <laughs> <laughs> that covers a lot of uh, yeah. a lot of ground too with all the that is a lot of ground yeah, all the variety. although i think i think most australians would come here and look at our pet trade and be like yankee cowboys i i i crikey whatever uh because it's pretty it, it's pretty uh I mean, it is chalk and cheese between whatever. our two right yeah like as yeah, we were sure. before the show started like we've got a couple of big things and for instance probably our most Sketchy snakes are probably, for size-wise, are probably scrubbies, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. we're pretty well internally regulated as a community. You know, like there's the odd dero that you know gets a scrubby somehow, and you're like, this is a terrible decision. <laughs> you know, like how did you get here? Blah blah blah. Yeah. But most people that breed like scrub pythons are pretty on top of who they sell them to. You know, yeah, and they don't breed yeah. prolifically. Like they have large clutches, but like, yeah, it's a really well internally managed species for us. Well, other things yeah. like lace monitors. Mm-hmm. Here aren't nearly as well. You know, mm-hmm. to be totally frank, I'd be happy if most of the lace monitors here were legally exported to the US because they're probably going to get better homes than 90% of the mouth breathers that get them here. Mm-hmm. You know, like there are just mm-hmm. some absolute idiots yeah. that buy them. And like we always joke about it with like the large and medium monitors because it gets to two years old and it's that size where it's like, oh, I can't keep it in a four foot tank anymore. And suddenly all of these monitors all at the same time, like, you know, back to back go up for sale. Yeah. Because all these people just realize they need like an Avery or something big. Yeah. Um, so, and you know, the U S is just like, it did my head in that you guys sell iguanas in pet shops, like yeah. green iguanas. Yeah. Like, oh, I, mean, I feel the same way. Yeah. A whippy, yeah. Thing, I think, I think know? you're giving us and, too much credit sending uh lace <laughs> monitors here. Cause yeah, we do the same thing with yeah green iguanas with yeah. all these different species. Yeah. So, and we can, we can get into that a bit more with the, with the fight, but yeah. I, I have a couple of additional questions for you. You know, I'm, I'm interested in, you know, are, are you, have you completed your PhD? Are you working on that now? Or? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're, yeah. You're done no, there. So I got, um, Oh geez, what's the term? I'm having a blank. Uh, confer or like I got, like it was approved uh, mm-hmm. just over twelve months ago. Okay, so, yeah. okay, cool, nice. So, Congratulations. And, and then what was your you. what Thank was you. your uh, research topic? Uh, um, so I worked on um, uh, sort of how evolu- uh, Let me try it again. I worked on how evolution and plasticity um, shape like the thermal physiology of a. a common lizard species here. So basically I looked at a whole heap of different, uh, or I did a bunch of experiments and um, field studies looking at how um, the physiology of this species um, was shaped by different evolutionary and like sort of experienced life factors. So okay. um, I looked at a lot of That's climate stuff. Yeah. Um, I did, um, I actually, so one of them, like one of my projects, which is in review and I know you've spoken about it um, previously, just about mm-hmm. journals and impact factors and things like yeah. that. But for the general field, I've got one that's uh, in. Well, I got the review back, and I need to do a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's in a pretty high impact journal for our field. So, Very cool. but that was a project that was partially inspired by keeping reptiles at home and seeing things. Yeah. So, yeah. 
Um, Very good. You know, there's an, a case to be made there about the benefit of, you know, having pet reptiles and being able to see something and be like, I wonder if I tested this experimentally, what that actually means. Yeah. So, that's very cool. That's yeah. that's exciting to hear too that you can, you know, translate that uh keeping experience into a project. That's really really uh cool. What what species was it that you were looking at? Yeah, it uh, so the uh, it's called the Jackie Dragon. Oh, yeah, so yeah. it's uh, okay. Amphibularis muricatus. Okay. Yeah, very common. Yeah. Um sort of gray gamut. Well, no, you get some colorful ones actually. There's red ready colored ones and greeny ones and yellow ones. <laughs> yeah. Uh you know, it's not like a fluorescent bearded dragon, but you yeah. know, they they're attractive in their own right. That's very cool. Um but yeah, so I, I worked on those guys. And then my current job, I'm working on um, the evolution of viviparity. Okay. So nice. like live birth in reptiles. And so we're using um, – Australia's got several. Pardon mm-hmm. me. Sorry, just one second. <laughs> Sorry for those who didn't say you need to cough. Um, <laughs> um, I'm working on the evolution of viviparity. So we've got mm-hmm. several species here that have what's called bimodal reproduction. Mm-hmm. So some individuals in the same species um, from certain populations display egg laying, yeah. and then same species, different populations display live birth. Yeah. And so of those, I think we've got three here, or three reported, two are well-known, and I'm working on the more two well-known ones, mm-hmm. but we actually know that they've also got an intermediate stage as well. So it's kind of like a uh, – or it's it's viewed as a transitional step between um, oviparity, so egg laying, and mm-hmm. viviparity. So the embryos are still eggs, they're laid as an egg, but yeah. they're a lot further along in development. So yeah. like instead of seeing, for those that have seen, you know, a reptile leg, you see that sort of red ring yeah. on the egg. Um, instead of seeing that, you see a developed embryo, like there's a little uh-huh. eye that's already formed and yeah. there's a little sort of baby skink in there already. Mm-hmm. Um that's that's so similar to I, I think uh, uh, Dale Donardo did did a lot of studies with uh, uh, children's pythons and and saw that they were laid at like stage twelve or you know whatever yes. stage it is you know and they, and you could see the yeah. little embryo with the eyes and stuff you know it's like I I didn't realize you know I always thought oh when an egg's laid it's it's got you know the full development to do but a lot of the development has already occurred once it's laid and then there was a recent study I think was it a turtle or and they 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 could either they could hold on to their eggs depending on the environment they were in so if if the conditions yes, were yeah. too hot they could hold on to them for longer and then lay them just before hatching or or lay them you know quite a bit bit uh, sooner than that so yeah very very exciting and interesting field. there's a lot of crazy mechanisms <laughs> yeah. that reptiles have with respect to like timing nest parturition or like you know parturition and nest site selection and things like that yeah. like you know in a variable world which is the reality of what we live in. Like things aren't consistent. Um, Well, you know, they can be consistent, but they're not necessarily always consistent. You want to have a good toolkit that allows you to have your best chances at, you know, your offspring succeeding. Mm -hmm. And so they've evolved all these wonderful mechanisms, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, They do Um, do well. (laughs) Very cool. That's That's an exciting, exciting area of research. So they look forward to seeing some of your papers and stuff. I'll have to to look you up on PubMed. I've got a huge (laughs) backlog that I need to actually get out the door, which I know a lot of people (laughs) in academia have, but (laughs) that's the uh, challenge. My career stage, you really need them out the door. (laughs) Uh Yeah. 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 yeah, Yeah, Right. (laughs) Me, I'm I'm resting on my laurels from this point. You know, (laughs) 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 I had a, I had a colleague, Ask me that, like, in it in yeah, at this I, point, huh? I, just, I recently got pr- promoted to you know professor a year or two ago, and and one of my colleagues was like, "Oh, so now you can just rest on your laurels, right?" I'm like, "Yeah, if only <laughs> if only that were the case." And I'm not tenure case, track, yeah. so I can't rest on anything. You know, I gotta gotta get the funding. So, but yeah, we're I mean, when we have these huge outbreaks of viral disease, that's you know that's all we need for me to get funded. So I was gonna say I mean, that's I, uh, working to you for sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're the no, only I don't think... few few people that get excited about an outbreak. Not because you know people are dying. You know, don't don't get me wrong there, but just because it's you know people have an interest in in funding antiviral research. So yeah. Anyway, uh, I think with anthropogenic <laughs> climate change and tropical disease, yeah. you will be doing fine. Yeah, I think long it's job security for sure. But yeah, yeah it's unfortunate sure. to see. For sure. Then again, you know, they're going to close down the government because the debt ceiling's been reached, so we won't get any funding or something. <laughs> Some goofy thing like that. Whatever. We'll do us in. Whatever. Yeah, we've, we've been through these things, I guess. But, well, I, okay. I, I think this this is a record for our large, longest introduction and kind of so, yeah, con- <laughs> but it, congratulations. Like, no, but, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know. Oh, this no, is great. It's, yeah, it's, it's been very uh, useful yeah. and in, informative stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. So, 
Um, let's, let's get on with the fight. So today we're going to talk about, you know, should, uh, pet stores and pet shops be able to, to keep, uh, or to sell these large species or species of, of, you know, that require more than the average pet keeper can provide, you know, kind of, uh, and I, I think, you know, your background in, in working in a, in a reptile shop or a, a pet store is, is a really good, uh, background for this topic. So thanks for uh, well, it's, suggesting and it's, it. And thanks for coming on. Yeah. Yeah, this is, <laughs> this is what we like. This so. is super interesting because, yeah. you know, our two, our two kind of hobbies, you know, our two are, you know, Australia and us don't, their pet shops don't operate the same mm-hmm. way. So there's, there's some, some little different incentives, little different mechanisms and, but, but still, I think the fundamental question still holds pretty yeah. true. So yeah. it's a, uh, uh, yeah, very interesting. And I, I'm glad we got to spend some time unpacking how that worked a little bit yeah. up front. Yeah, so that I was think good that, background. That, that helps. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. All right. On, on. Okay. Work. Well, Mr. Chuck, why don't you call the flip to see who gets to tails? Tails. It's tails, man. You're on a roll. Hey. <laughs> yeah. What do you, what do you want? I'm I'm happy to fight this one. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, yeah. take the moderator role. And keep you guys, you cool. know, keep your cool. And <laughs> all right, let's. Uh, <laughs> all right, Mitchell, you want to call the the uh, next one for what to- what side of the topic you get? So heads. Uh tails. <laughs> Sorry, man. <laughs> That's all right. So Chuck, what uh, what side would you like, and do you want to go first? Which is a redundant question, but anyway. Boy, uh, I think I will take the the pet shops being able to sell whatever species they want. That that's okay. a that, that so the pro you know, that they should be able to the pro sell yeah that, that they should have the autonomy to sell whatever okay. uh, they they want. Very American view of things, you know. We do, I, do whatever I the hell that, we that want. That would be fitting. Yes, <laughs> <Yeah>. yes. <laughs> All right. My young problem. Get out of here, you mangy kid. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess just kind of thinking about that, like uh, um, if there was a Parenti for sale in a pet store here, I would very much want them to be able to sell those. <laughs> yeah. yeah but that's oh, like my yeah, dream yeah. species. But yeah, of course, I yeah. probably wouldn't be able to do them justice. Not many can. Like, I'll, you know? fi- yeah. I'll figure, I'll figure it out. out yeah. Okay. I'll, yeah, I'll kick exactly. one of my kids that's, out and use the room. Yeah, yeah like, that's, a, that's the American yeah, way. Exactly. Right there yeah. I don't know. This is an opportunity. I can't. <laughs> yeah. Do. All right. So anyway, uh, well, yeah. let's uh, Chuck, did you want to go first? Or do you want to let Mitchell go? Um, you want to go first? Yeah, I'm happy either way. <laughs> yeah. Whatever okay. works for right. you. Easy go. Go for it. That, <laughs> I, I, I have a tradition of, of always letting the other person go first if I can. So <laughs> I, I will carry on. Let them first. hang themselves with their own rope. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't think I don't think there'll be any hanging. Yeah, today, right, but, right. let's have but, a uh, Dr. Hodgson start. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I was just going to offer a quick joke on your uh, comment about the Parenti and the pet uh, shop, by the yeah. way, Justin. Um, <laughs> I don't know if many of the people listening or yourself are familiar, but there's a journal, like an um, interest journal called BWAC, which is yeah. like a monitor-specific, mm-hmm. and yep. it's you know, public access. I've, I've published in you know, it, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, cool. Yeah, I had an oh, observation really? okay, of yeah, some awesome. uh, Ackies breeding in the wild in, in the Alice Springs uh, oh. Reptile, or no, Alice Springs Desert Park, where... You know, they had, oh. and they were wild, living on the grounds of the of the place. But they were, yeah, copulating, and I heard some noise, and so I, you know, just recorded information and published it there. So, <laughs> yeah, that's cool. <laughs> um, I was just going to say there was a um, article in it a few years ago now about monitors in the pet trade. Um, but one of the things they highlighted was an advert for uh, Parentes in a pet shop in Japan. Yeah. And anyway, said highlighting got onto the radar of various people that are like. A parenti in a pet shop in Japan, <laughs> and it didn't end well for the pet shop who got looked into because oh, really? of their parenti. So uh, if you saw yeah. a parenti in a pet shop in the yeah. U.S., I probably wouldn't buy it. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Not for the reason yeah. of caring for a parenti and having a uh-huh. room, just because you're probably going to get a knock on the door. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yes, yeah, so I would buy it in <laughs> cash, and I would give a fake name, and I would kiss <laughs> a fucking beer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so... Uh, I guess the big motivation for this and for the discussion and what I want us to bring forward is that even a well-meaning, so any animal that a pet shop should sell, they should sell realistically with the attitude. And I think it has changed in years gone by, but originally I think pet shops were all about flogging the animal and not caring about it after it's gone out the door, really. Like, you know, there is certainly ones, and this is 
we're talking about painting with a blanket brush, right? So I'm happy to accept there's nuance, and I think people should realise there's nuance here. There are people with different degrees, but broadly speaking, you get your sale out the door, you've sold the animal, you've sold the equipment, you probably give some follow-up advice if the person comes back in, but you're not actively invested in where that animal's gone yeah. so much. And with something that's small, robust, easy to manage, um, say, again, small pythons, small colubrids, whatever, that's easy to do because you can sell everything in one sale and be guaranteed that that, that animal's going to a good home and everything's good. As a pet shop, if you've got a baby, and particularly I think you've got like Asian water monitors are a big one over mm. there, like with all the mutations and stuff. Um, I mean, Burmese and retics, like it's mind-blowing that they have retailed in the volume they are to me. Like something that big, that's, and I know it's sort of entered the, the discourse across herpetoculture in both the UK and the US now, mm-hmm. but they're, they're, they've been marketed for years as like, you know, the perfect snake for someone getting into it. You know, this is, you want a big snake, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And they're just not appropriate. There's no way you can ensure that that's being kept correctly, that you're doing things right, that the, the public risk aspect. And I think broadly with all of this as well, and this is going to get into a bit later, is the public perception and what that means for keeping overall. But so I guess the key point I'm trying to get at here is, is that there's no way you can accurately guarantee if you're selling these things in volume as babies in a starter setup, whether they be berms, retics, um, lace monitors, again, because that's probably a common one here, right. the medium-sized monitors, we have Asian water monitors. You sell it as a baby and it goes into, say, a three- or four-foot enclosure to start off with. Mm-hmm. Within two months... Oh, sorry, probably not two months, probably within 12 months, you know, definitely needs to be in a four foot. Right. Um, mm-hmm. Within 18 months, two years, you know, four foot, six foot, and then realistically something way bigger, you know, mm-hmm. like, right. and, you know, how long is a piece of string? Like, you can give these things massive enclosures and they'll use all the space. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, for the case of retics, you know, look at Tom Crutchfield. He's got a massive aviary for him, mm-hmm. and, you know, he's got photos of it zipping around everywhere. Yeah. Um, so I just think there's a, a near impossible burden to accurately and like correctly make sure that they're going to a home and you can vet them and you can do everything like that, but it becomes near impossible to actually make sure that people are going to take those steps. And then on top of that, the commercial availability of enclosures for them that are actually adequate is pretty low. Like, you know, Mm -hmm. I don't know about the U S but like, um, we've had massive issues. I shouldn't say massive issues here, but as the perspectives have changed and the pet shops have led the push we've actually seen a change in like the minimum enclosures that commercial manufacturers will make. Oh. So we used to not have six foot, like our, our standard pet shop turtles get like massive, you know, we don't yeah. have small turtles yeah. that you can buy in pet shops. We have small species, but they're not buy it, like a, a round or being able to be sold mm. and then, you know, not cheap. Yeah. But like our, you know, Murray rivers, which are our common pet shop turtle get massive. And for ages, people were housing them in tiny tanks and they were all, yeah, yeah they get monstrous and they're in these small tanks. The red eared slider. Um, it was only yeah. after it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And after the push from pet shops, which were the ones that led the charge here, they were able to upgrade the minimum enclosure size. Mm. But that's because there was a good connection between the people that did it. But ultimately, you know, if you sell someone a baby turtle and it's, you know, that big, you know, 50 cent piece, or Australian 50 cent piece, I don't. I don't know U.S. currency size, but <laughs> you can't guarantee that when they get it home and it gets to that size, that they're actually going to give it an adequate enclosure. Yeah. And so it's just one of those things. I think there's a lot of shortfalls in the chain of being able to, for things that get super large or, again, pose a public health risk, you know, like large varanids get out or um, large constrictors. A, you've got a welfare issue for that snake because someone or that monitor because someone's going to see it, freak out and probably kill it. Mm-hmm. Or call, uh, you know, I guess animal controls are US equivalent, but like call some sort of um, animal handler to come remove the animal. Yeah. Um, or, you know, you can be guaranteed that it's going to just have an inadequate life because you can't make sure that something that needs it, you know, yeah. I don't know, again, your size, but like five meter by five meter Avery isn't going to get that as an adult. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's kind of the crux of my point. Okay. All right. Chuck, you want to respond? <sighs> Um, oh, you're muted. Yeah. Oh, so sorry. What, what, before you say that, I, I, I just wanted to throw in this anecdote. I was, my wife was looking at uh, Facebook or something, and she saw one of her friends had uh, an Asian water monitor trapped in its in their window well here in northern Utah, right? And he was saying he was going to kill it or something. And she said, "No, wait, my husband will come get it." You know. So we went out there, and it was still there, and I was able to I you know, rescue it. And I I kept it for a few, you know a week or two until I found it a suitable you know place to live, and so it's. 
send it down to Joey Muggleston. But yeah, it was a uh, kind of an interesting thing where you don't expect to hear a, a water monitor yeah. on the loose, but yeah. 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 I mean, again, I, I don't know how, um, I'm going to argue that pet shops should be able to sell anything, but I don't know how popular what I'm going to say ends up being in the eyes of most Americans. Um, you know, it, 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 I think any pet shop should be able to do what the law allows them to do. Right. And in, and, and in the U S there is no regular or very few regulatory, um, you know, checks on pet shops here. So, so retics, berms, large varanids, they're all fair game and, and pet shops, you know, outside of the moral argument and their responsibility to find good homes for these uh, pets are just following the law. Um, and, 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 and I, as we kind of discussed in Australia, you know, the, the law is very, very widely um, but but at least you kind of have some, you know, some checks to that. And, and you know, you cited the example of the Parenti that got sold. And, hey, that that, uh, you know, that pet shop legally obtained the permit to allow to sell any type of varanid. And they got their hands on a legally obtained Parenti and they sold it. Now, whether or not that is. Um, you know, the best idea or who they sold it to. We don't know. Maybe that w- it, maybe that Parenti is living its best captive life. Um, and, 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 you know, not to say that. Um, and, 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 and I think as reptile keepers, we can look at uh, a large berm or a large or, or even a baby berm or a baby retake and say, Oh, yep. We know what the complications and difficulties the average person would have down the road with that animal. Um, and, and I think the question becomes, so if what we're going to say is that pet shops should either be able to sell these things or they shouldn't, then what we're really talking about is should we be able to keep certain animals period point blank or not? Because, and, and, and this is just the U.S. So, um, you know, nothing stops me from getting a, a retake or a berm, even if a pet shop can't sell it. And I can breed those things and I can sell them. So even if a pet shop can't, the, the bus doesn't stop. It doesn't even slow down. Right. And so to me, it's kind of like, all right, what we're talking about is a is the perception of a cheap, simple avenue to unload potentially dangerous animals, right? That's really what we're kind of where we're, where maybe the unknowing um, uh, kid or, or a a parent, you know, allows an animal that's grossly inappropriate to go to their son or daughter. Right. Um, and, And I agree that, 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 that can happen, but I think, you know, or I would at least like to think that, and, and, you know, I've, I, I have a local pet shop around me. They're very big. They have tons of stores. Uh, and, and the, 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 the employees that I know there tend to be fairly thoughtful. Um, are they going to, are they going to not sell an animal that somebody is, you know, fully committed that they want to buy that? No, they're not. But are they going to try to educate that person and say like, Hey, you know, I get it. This, this reticulated Python looks really cool. I just want you to understand this is what's what the reality is going to be. And I I do think that we are at a point in, in herpetoculture and, and uh, where there at least an, a, a greater effort is being made to, um, try to because we've ended up, especially in the U.S., in a legislatively driven, you know, dicey situation where we cannot afford to be reckless like we were in the past. Now, again, this starts to drive towards the legislative part of this, right, where Australia has done a lot of legislation around 
can't keep this. You got to do this. Here's and and we haven't done that. Right. And so I guess my whole thing kind of comes down to what, well, you know, either we just keep doing this business as usual. And, you know, I would say, relatively speaking, the issues that we have come from people who are reckless with venomous animals. Uh, you know, we, I, I don't, you don't see a lot of large constrictors having public incidents, incidents, uh, where somebody gets hurt or killed. What you see is animals that get released or, you know, things that, you know, uh, the, the Burmese pythons in, in the Everglades, all of those things are bad, but not all of those things are solely on people who bought their animal at a pet shop couldn't keep it and then threw it in the Everglades. Like, I don't, you know, it's, 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 it's much more complicated than that. And the Everglades problem is not just large snakes. So I, I think it's easy to look at the problems and say, ah, if we just controlled pet shops, especially in the U S if we just controlled pet shops, we'd be in a better place. No, we wouldn't. We'd be in the same place. Right. And I don't even think in Australia, under a very regulated system, you can totally stop. If you have an all varanid permit and you can legally obtain a parenti, you can sell it, right? Nobody broke any law. Nobody did anything. But but you still did something that's, um, you know, by by most keeper standards is like, whoa you sold a parenti to just an average person like that's crazy, you know, still, still kind of a a whoa moment. So it's, so to me, it kind of goes to either we say this animal is too dangerous to sell and nobody can have it or, and it, and then it becomes a total black market thing and that doesn't go away either. Right. Mm. So it's kind of like, I, I, you know, I, I hate to make it an all or nothing thing. And if I, you know, if I wasn't so American, like I could, you know, I can't resist making it all or nothing. Right. Um, It's, it's our way. Uh, But I I think, I think that's kind of been, that's my overarching is that, that it, it really comes into a situation where, and I'm not saying you do nothing. I'm not saying that, but what I'm saying is either you, you let this kind of stuff be sold out of pet shops or nobody has it. Nobody keeps it. I, I, so I'll turn over. I, I, I long way. You know, one one aspect of that I think you mentioned is you know the the responsible pet shop uh, employees or whatever that are educating the public or or, or withholding you know animals or or trying to talk them out of purchases they don't think are going to be a good fit. You know, so I, I think. Uh, you know, I'd like to hear your your uh, ideas on that in regards to you know what, what how the employees kind of fit into this and if if they can make a difference or or if the you know pet store goal, of course, to make money overarches that. So I I, um, I totally agree. And again, this whole conversation is like blanket brushes, right? Like yeah. we're, we're yeah. removing nuance. And I don't, I genuinely don't know the inner workings of U.S. pet stores. So I've never been there. I don't know how they work. I've been to like plenty of Australian ones. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, both I, in my state and others. I, I, um, sorry. I will say there, there is, there has been kind of a shift, at least, you know, I've, I see, I try to go into every pet store that I can, you know, to just cause, you know, just to check out their collections and stuff. And, you know, most of the time it's like, okay, it's kind of the same old stuff, but like, um, you, you really, and, and, you know, it's illegal now to import, uh, reticulated pythons. So you don't see reticulated pythons in stores and you typically don't see Burmese. And, and a lot of times you, you're not seeing the green iguanas and stuff, but you know, at least, you know, it, generally that, that has declined a bit. So I, you know, that's my, my observation and that may not match other people's observations. You know, there's probably yeah, still shops I, I, that do that. I, there's. But. There's a there's a bunch of retakes at the at the, my oh, local pet shop. Oh, but captive right bred, not sale. not the imports, is what yeah. I'm saying. I guess. Yeah, no, so, not not yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah they're yeah. St- they're still being sold, but not imported in big numbers, kept in a yeah. cage like fifty in you know in a big tank or something, and you yeah. pick out the one you like. So that's, or, or same that's with two you know, Judas Priest yeah. right now. So anyway, yeah, that's kind of maybe a, a background, a little bit of of pet stores that there are some changes, and you know, same thing with like red-eared sliders. I mean, generally the only red-eared sliders you see for sale are ones that somebody gave to the pet shop because they didn't want them anymore and then they're just trying to rehome them for the you know so i don't know things things are improving a little bit compared to 
you know, the, the wild west days of the you know eighties or nineties or whatever. But, um, so, so some improvements are occurring, but that's mainly, I would say legislation. So sorry. That's mm-hmm. no, 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 totally. And as I said, it comes on to a point I'll probably get into after I answer your question, but very much the sort of supply demand and how regulation fits into like the supply demand model of certain species, which mm-hmm. is kind of like some thoughts I've had on that big stuff in particular. And something I'll talk about with that print because I don't want to do that shop a disservice because I do like them. It's just yeah. the outrageous point of a parenti in a pet shop, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yep. But with um, the the staff, I absolutely agree with you. And so um, I think that they're, they're like gatekeepers almost. And I mean that in a positive way, not in like, a you know, how people like to talk about the venomous <laughs> community sort of way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, it's one of those things where, like, they are the front line and it comes down to their competency. Um, and so I, I wonder, and again, I don't know the U.S., and I've seen it here um, in different ways, but there's different qualities of the people at a pet shop. And I would quite happily say that the pet shop I was at had a really, really high standard. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I genuinely think that they they actively, and this is how I got the job, they looked for people that were interested in reptiles first, mm-hmm. and then they taught them how to be, uh, I guess, a salesperson, a, a like customer service. They taught you the skills. You know, if you had that coming in, that was great, yeah. but their key point was making sure that you were a competent, educated sort of reptile person. And there are a lot of people there that are doing various tertiary qualifications. Mm-hmm. So like one of the blokes yeah. um, that I worked with for a number of years, and he's still there, is just finishing up his vet degree to become an exotic vet. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, another bloke, like most people have done undergraduate degrees in, um, or doing an undergraduate degrees in like life or environmental sciences or biology or things like that. Wow. Like they had a really high standard for the quality of people there. And obviously yeah. like, you know, those people get those degrees, they move on to new jobs, but they like to find the best of the best. Wow. Now I've been to other pet shops in other States where I've spoken to the people and it's just a mum and pop business. And that's, fine i have no judgment there mm-hmm. but that pet shop in particular is also selling a mangrove monitor yeah now i don't know if you guys have experience with mangrove monitors but they are what's your podcast like for uh you guys tied on swearing or oh no you, know you swear <laughs> away man <laughs> i'm a, they are I'm a foul animals, mouth but they are they are shit pets like yeah. everyone i know yeah. with a mangrove monitor it whips it carries on it hates you <laughs> it is not something that should be sold in a pet shop yeah. If you want yeah. to be the sort of person that wants a pet mangrove and loves it to pieces and treats it well and appreciates how lovely it is, they're stunning monitors, but they are shit pets. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. there's no reason that that should be in a pet shop. And I know you guys have – they still like, we don't obviously have wild take. Well, we do have wild take, legal wild take, mm-hmm. but it's very controlled and very regulated. Yeah. But we don't have the same thing where, you know, there's shipments of baby mangroves bred on farms in, you know, Southeast Asia or eggs that are dug up or whatever and shipped to the U S and just retailed out the wazoo. We, wazoo, we don't have that. Yeah. And so we don't have the same high supply of these species that really aren't good pet species. Mm-hmm. And ultimately when the supply gets too high, that's where they start going to pets up. So I'll get them that in a sec. Um, but the problem is, is that, yeah, you've got this quality issue with the, the staff behind it. Like this mangrove monitor is not a beginner species. Mm-hmm. And it was in this pet shop interstate. And the staff really weren't what I would call reptile competent. You know, like I, I'd yeah. say they're fine. Like, you know, put a heat light on it, give it some water, feed it some crickets, it'll be fine. But mm-hmm. like, you know, with something like a mangrove, you've got to be prepping for people for the fact that it's going to be a whippy, angry animal. You'll be prepping people for the fact that it's going to be, you know, three foot long, that it needs mm-hmm. an aquarium to swim in, that it's arboreal. So it needs climbing perches, you know, all these things that for the good welfare of that species. And ultimately, this is another point I'll come back to is that, when you get these people that buy these species that they shouldn't, whether it be through pet shops or black market or whatever, and they get done for having stuff in shit conditions, it looks bad for everyone, you know? Yeah. And this is an example of that Florida thing that's been doing the rounds. Those guys have now, I think, sunk the Florida hobby. You know, those guys that got caught on camera or whatever saying yeah. we're going to release. I mean, it's been twisted, but I assume it's been twisted, but, like, <laughs> the, the article I read basically implied that they openly admitted on camera or on recording to saying they were going to release venomous snakes to get them established so that they could go collect them and resell, you know, like that's the logic, right? Yeah. Yeah. But, and I'm sure that's not the exact, I hope that's not the exact case, but like, that's the attitude. And, you know, this reflects on everyone. Suddenly everyone in Florida, which is already going through legislative nightmare, Mm -hmm. are wanting to release invasive venomous snakes to, you know, make profit. Yeah. And so these guys Mm -hmm. that get done with mangrove monitors in crap conditions, um, you know, suddenly everyone's a welfare criminal. And that's a big issue we have here. So just for some additional context about um, 
why I'm sort of interested in this where I got involved. Um, during my PhD, I actually got involved with our New South Wales legislative review of all the licensing. Mm. So I went to the stakeholder meetings and, you know, actively contributed and put forth submissions for species to be moved around and things like that. Cool. Um, and, you know, where things should be added, whatever. And to be honest, I got pretty burnt out because it's one of those things where you do a whole heap of work yeah. and then the legislators are like, we won't do anything. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. well, the regulators. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> it's going through review again now for anyone listening in New South Wales, but I'm sure as hell not in, involved in it because I can't be bothered to do it again. Um, yeah. But it opened my eyes up because historically here, our big issue was environmental. So they had concerns with illegal wild taking large numbers. They had huge concerns with um, people releasing species that shouldn't be released. Mm-hmm. You know, like, oh, my – well, not so much, but it was around – now the conversation has shifted because ultimately a lot of our the the regulatory hyperbole around impacts, environmental impacts, is you know for most things overstated. There are certain things unequivocally we shouldn't be stuffing with, yeah. um, but for most things, you know, I think there's a lot of hyperbole, and it's just so that we can have a strong regulatory agenda. Personally, personal opinion. Yeah. But the conversation yeah. has now moved on to um, welfare of those animals, and that is the next scape of herb keeping is animal welfare mm-hmm. you know all the anti sort of groups are suddenly publishing like they're publishing in scientific journals albeit not good scientific journals but <laughs> peer-reviewed scientific journals nevertheless yeah. um research sort of condemning various aspects of animal use trade whether it be skin trade whether it be pet trade whatever so they're publishing all this work which is giving them kudos when they write reports to government saying oh well this scientific paper by blah blah and blah blah found mm. that you know 25,000 ball pythons died in whatever or you know like this yeah. is again exaggeration but making the point yeah. but the conversation is now changing to welfare mm-hmm. and that was exactly what we saw here was the welfare of those individual animals yeah. and beyond that even here we had the regulators publish their own um, journal article in some small like domestic journals looking at pet trade, native pet trade aspects. So they published on, like, the number of um, released pets that have been found. And there was a really uncomfortable correlation here with when pet shops and um, started up, so when they were legalised, um, and when we had our carpet python boom. And there was a massive influx of carpet pythons being found out in the wild, like non-native carpets, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, and you could range. argue various aspects of that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, like, mutation, like, we had... Yeah. Um, when jags first became available here, it was like a breeding frenzy. Everyone was just mass producing jags to mm-hmm. cash in. Yeah. And suddenly you've got all these jags that have neuro. You've got all these jags that are kind of average. You know how like you get the good ones, yeah. the bad ones, yeah. <laughs> all the bad ones just got dumped, or uh, well, not dumped, but like flogged onto who would ever buy them. Yeah. And so mm-hmm. we had this massive su- oversupply. Ultimately, we just tried went to under. warn you guys. <laughs> <laughs> we tried to tell you. <laughs> I think it's uh, classic 2020 hindsight, right? Yeah. Thankfully, the, yeah, the jag boom, sure. jags are no longer around here, yeah. like really, yeah. in the volume they once were. Mm-hmm. Um, but here you've got either. supply issues. <laughs> yes. Yeah, here either. Um, so, yeah, it's just, the issue is, is it's moved to this welfare discussion, right? Mm-hmm. And so we as a community need to, whether it be private breeders or pet shops, need to focus on at least ensuring this welfare and self-regulating. Because that's the thing, right? If we don't self-regulate, yeah. We're going to get overregulated, and that's what happens. Yeah. yeah. And you know, yeah. when we show that we're actually playing by the rules and doing what we can and making sure things are right, that's where we will have a bit more leeway with um, regulators and like the layperson. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, there's like ten percent that are always going to be, or fifteen percent that are always going to be like, no animal should ever be in captivity. Fifteen percent of your diehard patriots that'll be like, I should legally own. Oh, sorry, I should be able to have whatever I want in whatever Avery I want, wherever <laughs> yeah. I want it. <laughs> exactly. Um, and then there's the seventy percent in the middle mm-hmm. that will play by the rules if the rules are good, mm-hmm. and will go, "This is a pretty stinky rule, you know. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. um, I don't want to abide by that." And that applies to anything, right? Like that that sort of fifty fifty. Sorry, fifteen fifteen seventy is like a thing that traffic uses, like a um, animal. Uh, what are they like use organization? Like they, they monitor mm-hmm. wildlife trade and stuff, but they, that's one of their mm-hmm. sort of like rough ratios where it's like, you always have people play by the rules. You always have people break the rules. You need to regulate for that 70% that, mm-hmm. you know, could go either way. That's if you try and regulate for the 15%, <laughs> yeah. it's not going to do anything, right? Yeah. Cause they're always going to break the rules. They don't yeah. give a crap. While, yeah. you know, the 15%, you don't need to meet their expectations cause they'll always do what's right. Mm-hmm. You know, they've just got this psychological drive to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but that middle percent's where it's at. Yeah. And so with, I guess, the the pet shop sector and like controlling, um, they are where, and you know, to be frank, it seems like a bit in the US and even here to a degree as well. Depending what they can sell, they become a bit of a dumping ground. Mm-hmm. You know, people just get rid of stuff that they don't want. Mm-hmm. That's not necessarily a bad thing, um, you know, but it means that if that pet shop has um, less than high standards, they're going to then just move it on to whoever will buy it, yeah. and then we've got this welfare issue proliferating. Yeah. And so this is kind of that point I just wanted to make about supply and demand, right? Yeah. Burns, Retix, all of that have – I don't know what their clutch size is. I just see the Jay Brewer videos on the yeah. like – yeah, and it's like, and, you know, it's like yeah. how can yeah. you find a home for that many animals? Uh-huh. You know, like yep. two clutches well, that's, of reeds without doing that's, everything I breed. Yeah. You know, like, yeah, that's that's <laughs> been the issue is where where do and I, I think that was you know um, I think that's probably the bigger the bigger unspoken thing is where do all these animals? You don't hear about animals getting out and attacking people or, you know, things like that. Why? Maybe that's because there's not that many of them that make it yeah. right. Like that's, that's yeah. probably the bigger um, truth of it. And that, that, that definitely touches into the animal welfare issue. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. That's, that's so, a, yeah. that's an extremely difficult problem because all of the animals that have huge clutch sizes and could make, you know, a, an unscrupulous breeder, <laughs> a lot of money because, you know, you've got this huge, you know, you can sell them for less because there's so many of them. And then that benefits the pet stores because they can buy them for less and sell them, you know, for a little bit more and make more money because they're moving, you know, units. <laughs> that's, I guess the, mm-hmm. you know, exactly. equating animals with money is kind of where we run into problems. And if, if we can get away from that and see animals as animals and, and having, you know, worth and, and, you know, we, we treat them properly and give them the space they need, those kind of attitudes, I think we, we run into a lot less problems. We regulate ourselves better. And yeah, it's, it's such a, a hard issue because, you know, a pet store wants to make money and stay in business, but I, I think you can yeah. do it the right way. It's, it's. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. And well, yeah. I think there's, you know, it's again, talking about the rules, you'll have 15% of pet stores that always do the right thing. Like they'll yeah. do best by their animals, you know, they'll, mm-hmm. they'll, you know, have sort of a degree in integrity and you're going to have 15% that won't. Yeah. You know, you always have 15 that are dealing, you know, whatever out the back, they'll buy a half dead, you know, mm-hmm. ball python and sell it to someone that has no idea how to assess the health of an animal, yeah. things like that. Like you're always going to have these bad ones, but we're talking again, that 70% in the middle. They're yeah. the ones that we need to make sure are on our side, following the rules and helping drive the conversation. Yeah. And I mean, you know, I, I'm genuinely dumbfounded with like the U S with these retics and things like that. Mm-hmm. Part of the issue I think as well, and I don't mean to tension into this conversation, but like is the morph trade and you know, that pyramid mm-hmm. scheme and yeah. all that sort of stuff. People, I like. I literally say to people when they buy animals off me with the intention of wanting to breed it down the line. You know, you new keepers. Mm-hmm. I go, okay, that's fine. Um, depends on the species, to be honest. Yeah. But like, this species will have a clutch of X. You know, that's going to be a lot to raise and find good homes. Mm-hmm. If you get eggs, freeze two thirds of them. You know, just kill those eggs off the bat. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, it's a humane way to euthanize them. Mm-hmm. Euthanize those eggs. Hatch the four, three, two, whatever of those eggs. Get a feel for raising those and then go. And if you want to upscale, do it like that. Mm-hmm. But the problem is, is when there's mutations involved, it's not as simple because you want to optimize your odds. You want to mm-hmm. get your <laughs> fucking 13 gene ball <laughs> python or 33 gene corn yeah. snake or whatever. Yeah. But you want to get that animal that's going to be your payday. Mm-hmm. And so you breed everything, you hatch everything. Um, and then you go, okay, cool. This one snake is the one I want, the triple snow hetford candy floss whatever that i don't know you guys have some stupid names um but you've got that snake now and those other 10 snakes you don't really give a shit about so what do you do you sell them to a pet shop and then they sell them on and there's nothing wrong with on selling that stock Mm -hmm. to a pet shop as a pet i think that's great and i know um having spoken to people here people do do that with big projects here like stuff that's worth a lot of money they will sell possets to pet shops without saying it's a pos hat for whatever, Mm -hmm. just to distribute it to a good home um, versus, you know, like every pyramid scheme breeder, morph chaser, you know, buying a pos hat, breeding 30 animals and realizing, oh, it's not het, it's just, you know, a wild type. And suddenly we've got 30 extra of this species. You know, like there's there's big 
big moves to be made for how we deal, particularly poshets. I think it should just be sold as wild type animals treated that way and respected that way. So to have this proliferation of people trying to breed stuff and crack big for cheap, you know, mm-hmm. because we've just got an oversupply of so many species. Yeah. And in part, I think it's because of the mutation trade. And with that oversupply, again, you see a lot of stuff go to pet shops, you know, nothing wrong with that again, as I said, but with that high volume of animals coming in, then you see people start to get things cheaper, as you said, Justin, and then flog them on for to whoever will buy them, especially when you know you've got stuff coming in through the wings, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's the point I did want to make about that parenti. The big difference we have here um, is, firstly, we do have that regulation, so they couldn't just sell it to anyone. They had to sell it to someone yeah. who's got a permit to own a parenti. Permit. Right, 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 right. First right. thing there. But on top of that, Parentes actually don't, like, people don't breed them consistently. They don't mm-hmm. breed large clutches of them. You know, you're lucky to get, you know, they can have, like, nine or ten eggs, I think, from memory. Yeah. But generally speaking, people hatch between one and four, mm-hmm. you know. That's usually the success rate is quite low. Yeah. I think the best I've seen in recent years was Joe Ball get four, and then I know other people that have hatched one mm-hmm. odd there. There's probably, like, you know, Peter Krauss used to breed them out in these pits and stuff and you know he was like an old timer that didn't really use social media so i never really saw <laughs> yeah, you know the volume of stuff he was breeding yeah. i know he bred a lot mm-hmm. um but you know they're not bred you know probably all the parentes bred in australia over the past five years would equate to one clutch of retics you mm-hmm. know <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. so it's one mm-hmm. of those things where it's a large species that isn't breeding in large yeah. volumes so it's still going to market people are still scrupulous about who they sell it to etc cetera, etc cetera. First, the retics where it really is like an oversupply issue. Yeah, and you know, and I imagine it wasn't to be said. wasn't cheap either. Sorry. You know, a parenti's not an inexpensive animal. You know, no, that I think it was like two and yeah. a half grand. Yeah, like yeah, it's, yeah. It, yeah, it was the finance price was regulating it too. Oh, no, right? that's like, cheap. Which, no. <laughs> which, yeah. which, which twenty five hundred bucks here, man. It'd be, that thing would be gone in a like. <laughs> I mean, you you forget well, it. Multiply that by well, ten. So, you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Australian. So what's that for you guys? Like seventeen hundred US. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. I mean, uh, you could, you could, you could triple or maybe quadruple that price, and it's no, still you would be you gone tenfold, drop tenfold. Yeah. Would be, yeah, I mean, it, yeah. It, it, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's the the trick, um, I guess, is because yeah, like when you over overproduce a, a sulcata tortoise, you know, they're a fifty dollar animal or a you know twenty dollar animal or something, and from the breeder perspective, they're just happy to move you know a hundred animals at a time because. They have yeah. you know three four hundred animals on on hand or something, but it's actually it's a few scale, females. Right? Like yeah, you wholesale that. You know, yeah. it doesn't matter. You yeah. don't have to deal with every individual person. You wholesale fifty cell cards to a pet shop. Yeah. You've got your payday. Yeah, and now you don't have to worry about it. I mean, and I should mm-hmm. say, I'm ter- like tortoises are so foreign to me because we don't have them. <laughs> no, that's but, you know that's how it goes. And it's yeah. just like. The Salcada thing blows me away. Yeah. Like yeah. the fact, you know, the size of them, mm-hmm. the destruction yeah, just, capacity. Not, yeah, yeah. It's like just get a, you know, red foot tortoise or something, you know, something tiny. Well, not tiny. You can get tiny turtles, but like yeah. you want a pet, get a medium size. Don't get a Salcada. Why are they the staple? Because they're easy to breed in large numbers. Yeah. And that's mm-hmm. not the right thing for it to be a staple, you yeah. know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they yeah. come, I, I don't know, I assume they probably still have wild like, you know, wild caught animals or whatever brought in, or are they, I don't know the legislation around them, but I'm sure there's wild and, stuff. And, yeah. and Americans have no chill, dude. We have no chill. Like, <laughs> huge tortoise, giant snake, you know, giant goanna. Like, we don't, we have no chill. Like, we're, there's no part of us that's like, mm, that's a bad idea. You know what I mean? Like, we're like, yeah. well, let's try it. Maybe it's not a bad idea. I mean, how am I supposed to know how this is going to work out? Right. Like, yeah. but, and I, I did want to just go back and touch real quick on, so, you know, I, I get a lot of these, um, you know, animal rights organizations and some of the push pull forces as far as like animal welfare, uh, becoming a huge things with reptiles, which make no mistake. It, what I'm saying is that is a positive, is, you know, nothing but a positive thing when we address better animal welfare conditions for animals. I think that the U S needs to do, you know, I think the U S needs to say, Hey, every, everyone should be keeping to it at, at a minimum AZA type standards. And maybe the AZA could have some of their standards changed a little bit so that they make more sense. I'm just saying a uniform standard would be something much better, even if it's not exactly what we see right now. Um, 
you know, having a standard of care is not a bad thing. And, and unfortunately, you know, when we talk about animal welfare, you know, a lot of times it's arbitrary, it's capricious. Um, and that's, that's kind of the big issue. And, and then, you know, if you want to talk about, we don't even as, so, so all, everything that I'm going to say here is all human centric problems. They're all problems that humans create and humans um, perpetuate, right? And, and we don't even treat each other well. We don't treat other humans of our, you know, of, of our, of our like species this correctly. Uh, that there is, you know, I would say, especially in the U.S., uh, the value system of life is, you know, is, is on sketchy ground. Um, and I'm only speaking for the U S just because I'm, I'm, I'm here. Um, and, and, and then you carry that over into other animals, dogs, ho hoof stock. I mean, horses, you know, horses are extremely dangerous animals and, you know, they suffer from some of, and, and the, the, so the, the regulation around horses, probably not that, you know, okay, so so you can own a horse and and the amount of care and husbandry that you need to take care of that horse is huge. But you see it all the time when economic conditions get bad. Horses get dumped or left or starved to death just like large retics. So it's so the this idea that um the animal welfare issue is concentrated to reptile keepers is is unfair um doesn't make it invalid i'm just saying it's a little unfair i feel like they use the low-hanging fruit of scary reptiles and and how tattooed people and you know people who maybe are on the fringe of society oh look at these weirdos look at these malcontents not taking care of animals not you know and 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 to your point, I have a pair of mangrove monitors, and they are not a uh, 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 they are not a a pet type monitor. Um, you know, you the 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 requirements that they have. They are. I've just accepted the fact that they're never gonna like be social. They're not. They're not. They hide all the time. You know, they. Um, mine don't whip. Um, I've maybe taken one kind of opportunity bite where they just the male kind of had enough of me and kind of just turned over and was like, ah, but mine are pretty good other than that. Uh, but, but for them to be sold to average people. Yeah, I agree with you. Ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Um, so I, I, I do, I do think that with the animal welfare issue, you know, there is an impetus for anybody who keeps animals to, have a, a high standard of welfare for their animals. That said, for for any regulatory or pet, you know, pet animal rights group to use that against us feels a little shitty because, you know, they there's, you know, the trough is very deep and they're using us as the low hanging fruit. Um, and, and then to talk uh, environmentally, you know, if you kind of get into the environmental factors of animals being released and yeah, I, I think that's a consideration, um, certainly. And, you know, you can look at the Everglades, you can look at, um, you know, what's happened with large constrictors and, and there's all kinds of stuff that's loose there that is, you know, way, mammalian feral stuff that is way more out of control than primates fish yeah 100 percent. like, I like all kinds how of many stuff. primate species have been established there some have been eradicated yeah. crab eating macaques <laughs> there were yeah. like a wild population of crab eating macaques down there like <laughs> and that's not that's yeah. not what's yeah. on the news that's not what's thrown at yeah. you know the average person they're like what there's giant constrictors well there's crocs there too i mean those are scary like oh but they belong there oh okay got it well Let's look at the list of stuff that doesn't belong there and see, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, I and, and, you know, I guess I feel like the other issue with the environmental thing is, again, this is a human centric problem. We're the cause of all of this stuff. And and so to so to have global trade and to have, you know, global transport, which moves 
feral stuff all you know mm. all over the globe and then to be like ah it's you pet trade people that are ruining this for everybody is again targeting the low hanging fruit mm. um and and uh, are we a contributing factor to the problem? Yes, but in the grand scheme of things, are we the problem? I, and, and, and by us, I mean the reptile community or reptile keepers. Um, I, you know, I would argue that you know we contribute, but you know we should not be the tip of the spear that gets knifed in the side. Mm-hmm. I was going to say just on that point, like. This is broadly one of my opinions about it. I think there is actually a lot that the reptile trade, pet trade, is guilty of and needs to either hold itself to account or be held to account for. But I also think it is a bit of a whipping boy, basically, for other issues. You know what I mean? I know you guys have sort of alluded to that, but there is – it's an easy thing to throw under the bus Mm -hmm. and say – but there are things that it's guilty of. Like the whole – like I remember I went to an international conference and saw someone who worked on Madagascan plowshares, Mm -hmm. like the tortoises, and the things that got done for that because of the pet trade, like the, the rampant illegal take when they're already low numbers in the wild, breaking into a breeding facility and stealing them, yeah. people unashamedly putting photos up of animals that had, had their shells like intentionally defaced with ID numbers yeah. to detract from, like unashamed. Like that is something that we as a hobby need to hold our head in shame about. Like that is yeah. horrible. Mm-hmm. You know, we're talking a threatened species, People just not caring and wanting to profit at the end of it. And that's where we need to be clipped on the years. Mm-hmm. Now, yeah. other stuff where it's safe in the wild or like, you know, ball pythons, for example, like I don't see a need to take them from the wild anymore, but I don't think there's a huge, from what I've seen, and I could be wrong, and I'm happy to be wrong here, but it seems that they seem to like our brown snakes, right? They proliferate, proliferate really well in areas of human development. So they're probably in unnaturally high numbers anyway, you know? Mm-hmm. Like they just do well in these modified landscapes. Yeah. But that's just a point I think. You know, we're guilty of a lot of things and we need to be held account for it. But I also think we get slogged as a, you know, it's easy to paint that brush on everyone. Um, on your point on horses, I actually totally agree. So I <laughs> find horses incredibly scary. The first time I rode a horse, I got kicked off one. And this is why I kind of empathize with people that are like scared of snakes, right? Like you have a bad experience, you don't like it. I'm not scared of horses, but I don't like them and I don't like being near them. Like, I think that you see the muscles on that animal, it'll kill you. Oh, like, yeah. I'd yeah. rather an allow any day than a bloody <laughs> Yeah. 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 You know? They can sew you up from a parenti, it providing it doesn't get you in the wrong spot. But a horse will kick you dead right there where you stand. Well, and, and too, yeah, like the mental. environmental impact in Australia with the Brumbies and, you know, the, and, yes, and, the, yeah. and, and the reluctance. You know where they they kind of they kind of have a, an unfair bias towards the cute cuddly animal you know mammal versus yeah. the reptile where you know oh they'll they'll let the horse go out and destroy habitat for endangered frogs but you know we're not gonna we're not gonna go cull those animals because they're cute and cuddly and people will be upset about that. Yeah. It's kind of crazy. Like I know the Brumby issue is a bit of a tangent, but it's amazing the the strength of opinions on that they should be here. And I mean, we recently like past six months had an issue where um, they did a cull, like they did a cull and, you know, they do their best to make sure that obviously any of the animal, the aerial shoot them Mm -hmm. aren't visible to public because they want people seeing, you know, dead animals that they've shot. Um, But someone literally just walks, you know, 300, 400 meters off a track and found a hole, heard that it had been shot off the track, mm-hmm. and that blew up huge. Like they just oh, had yeah. photos of all these horses that have been shot. Yeah. And suddenly the conversation just reignited with this, like, fervent, like, oh, my God, you know, they shot – and one of them was pregnant, which isn't probably a good thing that they shot yeah. a, a mere. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it just started this whole – again, it taps into that emotional yeah. element. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. When you Nobody wants to see a dead like, horse, you know, but yeah. – yeah. yeah, and this is the same thing with, like, welfare with all these animals. Mm-hmm. We're talking, again, you know, we're a community. We understand these things. This is what we care about, blah, blah, blah. The layperson seeing it, and it's a perspective issue. The layperson sees a half-dead corn snake, ball python, bearded dragon, whatever – it taps into that animal abuse. It's like, you know, RSPCA, which is our compliance thing, every ad has a dog that's half dead because yeah. suddenly everyone's like, oh, my God, someone did that? Mm-hmm. Take my money. Yeah. You know, and I'm not saying I'm, I'm in support of RSPCA. You mm-hmm. know, I think 
they can be heavy handed, but like they do amazing work mm. for people that abuse animals, you know, which Again, is, which is the op- Sorry. <laughs> opposite here with like the HSUS, you know, they're, they're heavy handed, well, but they're also using that money not to help animals, but to rate, you know, to legislate against being able to keep animals. So you think you're helping yeah. the, the cute little dog, but you're actually funding their, um, their, their, their plan to not allow anybody to have a dog, you know, where it just, you know, kind of, kind of sad that, that we're in that state with things, but. And quite frankly, it goes into regulatory agencies like fish and wildlife. Mm. Like when they, when they have protected species that they're overseeing and they get something like a coyote or a pack of coyotes that move in, they hire an outside contractor to hunt and shoot those coyotes dead Mm. so that they can protect a dying species, which they don't advertise that to the public. They don't talk about that, yeah. but it's just a reality of, of, you know, what you have to do to protect a, a, a species. So, mm-hmm. you know, there's all kinds of, you know, well, we keep this quiet and we keep that quiet, oh, yeah. but yeah. You, you know, it, it, and so, and I guess, you know, like, look, it, there's a lot of consideration and, and I think things like that just kind of muddy the waters and it, and it, it makes it easy for reptile people to be like, oh, yeah, well, what about this? And what about that? And what about this? And, and I think some of it is used as a justification uh, for them not to police their own house because, oh, well, nothing else is fair. So why should we have to act yeah. accordingly? Right. Yeah. And, and that's, that's you know, the wrong that's approach bullshit. to take. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. bullshit. But, yeah. yeah. But but at but the, happens, but at the yeah. same time, like that, you know, it, it is it is pretty difficult uh, to stomach some of the hypocrisy when you feel like it's it's coming at you more than things that probably cause greater problems than you yep. do. Yeah, it's yep. disproportionate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a good good way to say but we're that. So, again, like we are low hanging fruit. Like mm-hmm. as you totally yeah. implied. Like the thing is, is that you know I would say there's genuinely a disadvantage that's been dealt. But as much as there is things that we brought on ourselves, right, as a community, mm-hmm. like we. I think we've got a perspective issue, not just from how we do things, but just the fact that it's reptiles. This guy has a thousand snakes in his basement, you know, mm. blah, 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 blah. Like there's a perspective issue there that we're never going to get away from. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I don't know how it is in the US, but and I'm sorry, this is tangenting more so into a welfare debate, but I guess that's the, the <laughs> core of yeah. this yeah, discussion, I, I right? Do. Is like, you know, um, but I wonder how it is with like, say for instance, dogs over there with the like, the large scale societies and like the organizations that are like the, the peak bodies here, our dog peak bodies are huge. Like we have, they have huge say they're multi-million dollar organizations. They're run by like the passionate dog breeders and stuff. And obviously mm-hmm. there's a lot more money in dogs than there is in reptiles, mm-hmm. but the professionalism as a, at a, a level and they have, just as much, if not more, regulatory hoops to jump through, hmm. they handle and negotiate it really well. And there's a standard that we could look to at these other organizations, um, I think, where as a, a community we can bring it up, right? Like, Because the thing is, is like you can bitch and moan and carry on about, um, you know, oh, this is unfair or whatever, but it doesn't change the fact that it's coming, right? Like yeah. this is the thing yeah. that's done my head in with yep. the U.S., right? Everyone's like – it seems almost with um, – I've, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but everything I see about US Arc, which I view as your peak organization, is all reactive. Everything is reactive. Mm-hmm. It's like this legislation comes in, we're going to fight it. Does US Arc have a code of practice? Like, why don't they just have a code of practice? They should going, all right, all US Arc members are expected to follow this code of practice for the keeping of ball pythons, the keeping of mangrove monitors, the keeping of whatever. You know, they get, however, I don't know what their income is. I remember someone sent me a, um, the tax statement or whatever, because it's on their website. But like they got a decent amount of money, but it seems like, you know, just put someone on for a couple of days a week, a couple of hours a week to write these codes of practice for community consultation, things like that, mm-hmm. and show that we're self-regulating and moving forwards. Because otherwise, you know, the world's catching up, you know. Gone are the days where, like here, for instance, you talk to all the old timers, it was totally normal to go out and catch whatever you wanted. You found a of whatever, like guys that used to work on gas pipelines used to just bag up every snake that fell into the pipeline and take it home as a pet or sell it to someone. Mm-hmm. That's 40 years ago, 30 yeah. years ago, whatever. You can't do that now. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, 10 years ago, you couldn't sell reptiles in pet shops. Now you can't, and you sell those. Now you can. Mm-hmm. Like the rules change. And if you like bitch and moan and say the rules are changing and I don't like it, it doesn't matter. 
the rules are changing. <laughs> like you gotta, <laughs> yeah, keep the up damage is done sense, and they're, yeah. they're moving on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, so, um, um, well, and I, I do know that U.S. Arts Board is primarily comprised of business owners and people who, you know, are kind of within the, the reptile, you know, have a commercial interest in the reptile uh, community. Um, and so I think some of that, you know, that that may be why they tend to be more reactive is because they're 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 one, they're focused on, you know, how how can this impact um you know the the commercialization of of reptiles mm-hmm. rather than you know looking at it from uh and that's not to say that they don't and that, that that's not i uh, please don't misquote me here and string me up by my freaking toenails <laughs> but um you know I, I think that's probably a lot of why that is the way it is and i think there needs to be a, a shift and I don't know if it needs to be a new agency or U.S. Arc needs to make a pivot, but I agree with you is we need to start, you know, doing because 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 being reactive is 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 one piece of it. But once you show that you're proactive, then, you know, it I, I feel like it changes the conversation in the room with people when they're like, well, you know, okay, yeah, there's this going on. What are you doing about it? Well, I'm glad you asked. Here's what we have proposed. Boom, 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 boom. Mm-hmm. Where if you can't speak to that, if you can't speak to what you're doing to correct the problem, then they're like, yeah, that's why we're correcting the problem, mm-hmm. right? So, but, yeah. And that's, I, I, that's exactly it, right? Like I, So the main reason I actually got involved with that review I mentioned earlier mm-hmm. was I was part of people that were making or trying to push for a shift to have more mammals legalized in our state, native mammals. So mm-hmm. things like sugar gliders, you can own them in yeah. South Australia and Victoria, but here they're illegal. And there's a really strong, you won't be able to keep them sort of attitude. Like we have a policy on our, our regulators website. That's like, why you shouldn't keep native mammals. Mm-hmm. And so when we made this push during this review, we contacted a whole heap of experts, literally someone from the, the welfare regulator. So our, our government welfare regulator, we spoke to him cause he wrote the book on keeping those mammals in captivity. Like literally tome, you know, yeah. massive thick book, how to keep every Australian native mammal in captivity. Um, he's the head of what he was. He's in a different position now, but he was the head of like working out the welfare standards for them, all that sort of stuff. Um, we spoke to interstate organizations and we prepared this massive document that systematically attacked each of these bullshit points that was up on the website. We also submitted a code of practice we wrote. So we took other states' legislation and said, this is an example code of practice for one of these species. Mm-hmm. Like, we made every preemptive push we could to show that we're not here to fuck around. We're quite interested in doing this, and we want to do this right. And where we ended up with that is that the regulator from the – sorry, the, the guy from the welfare regulator was on board with us. He said, I would personally support a handful of species being added. Mm-hmm. We had one of the aunties, so our big thing here, and this is part of our issue with oversupply, the way our rules work is that if a non-native pet is found in the area, a wildlife rehabilitation organisation are the only ones that can legally hold on to it. Mm-hmm. So what happens is if a snake catcher gets it or a member of the public finds it, they have to call these wildlife rehabbers, they collect it, and then up until recently, as I understand it, there's been huge issue, issues with um, parks and wildlife for us issuing authorities for them to move those animals on. And so it's led to all these massive carpet pythons, bearded dragons, whatever the hell's been found, just sitting with these people that don't give a shit about captive reptiles. They care about rehabbing wild stuff. Mm -hmm. And so they're getting jaded. They've always been anti-pet keeping, but they're now even more strong about that. And so it's one of these things where we've got this massive build-up. Um... uh, Shit, where was I? Sorry, I've I've lost my point. What was the thing just before I talked about the wise guys? Oh, oh well. Um, but, yeah, so it's just about being, oh, the mammals, yeah. yeah. But we yeah. had one of the more moderates of those guys in that those wildlife rehab groups. She was on our side. She was like, look, I think it's going to happen. I would like to see it done right. And that's mm-hmm. all she said. Mm-hmm. She's like, I'll support you if you're going to do it right. We mm-hmm. have minimum standards. We talk it through. So she was an auntie, mm-hmm. and she was on our side because we were going to do it right. And, you know, you're always going to have the Peter extremists. And, again, 15% will never be able to deal with. we just got to yeah. manage them in their own way. Yep. But the more moderate people, you can win over. And so I think the – I don't know. I just think there's a whole 
more proactive discussion to be had here yeah. about, um, and this comes back to the supply issue, right? Like maybe retic shouldn't be, I don't know. What's a, what's a wild type retic worth over there? You don't see them anymore, so they'd probably be yeah, more so, worth oh, right. than a, than a, so, yeah. Morphs, morphs <laughs> tend to be prevalent to what you see. I see, I've seen, I've seen some stuff that's advertised as dwarf. So I think there's still, you know, maybe a handful of people who who have some some wild type stuff that was brought in that they're still keeping. But most of everything is morphs. And um, what's low end? You know, what's your base level yeah. morph? Two, two, like two hundred, three hundred bucks sometimes, mm-hmm. depending okay, upon. That's, that's probably it's, I mean, than yeah, I was expecting. It, I was thinking like green iguanas were twenty bucks or something. I remember. Yeah, no, 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 no. Like so, I think so I think the days are, of yeah, fifty dollar yeah. retake and berms <laughs> yeah. are gone. Yeah. Um, I think yeah. which that was kind know, of my right point food, of so. you know the 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 yeah. amount of wild cots and and just green iguanas, Burmese, all that kind of stuff in pet shops is kind of fading away, and and we like and, to and see I th- that and continue. I think, but I yeah. think and I think in our 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 modern political climate around reptiles i think most pet shop owners realize that they have some responsibility and like you said in the 15 percent, you're gonna have the asshole who doesn't care and is like hey if i can get it in my hands on it i'm gonna sell it and i don't care i'm just gonna do it because other people are being responsible and they don't have it so if somebody wants it they can come get it from me Right. Like, well, so in long term, you know, I yeah. think that's a, that's a health, or, you know, to, to have the attitude of like, I'm in this for the long haul. I want to do it responsibly because if I do it the right way, then down the road that will pay dividends. You know, I might mm-hmm. lose a sale here or there now up front, but down the road, people are going to trust, okay, these guys know what they're talking about. They've been here. They're clean. They're, you know, doing it the right way. So I'm going to trust them. And I, I've seen examples of that. Unfortunately, you do see the examples of people doing it the wrong way who stay in business somehow. You know, like, how does this, how is this shop still in practice? You walk in and it just smells like ammonia. You know, you can't even stay in the store for longer than five minutes. But I guess, you know, maybe it's just people not being educated. But I think with, you know, YouTube and all these influencers, hopefully the word's getting out a little bit more that, hey, we need to keep these things the right way. You know, yeah, say what you want about Brian Barczyk, but he's showing... Uh, you know, a giant reticulated python in a giant cage with a tree, you know, that kind of stuff where it's like, this is how they should be kept rather than, you know, in a, in like he used to in a, in a rack system, you know, in his basement or whatever. That's fair. Or, or, so that's fair. I, I don't know. I, I, I'm hoping that's kind of the message that's getting out these days is like, you know, keep them, keep them uh, right. One thing I think is really like a, a surprisingly good tool. And I don't know how it applies in the other states, but it's certainly here. And I think it's something that changes the game entirely. One of the conditions of the pet shop license is mandatory lifetime rehoming. Hmm. So if you sell an animal, the entire time you're in operation, you are legally required to not be in breach of your license and therefore have it canceled. Mm-hmm. I mean, they probably wouldn't cancel it, but you get fined. Yeah. You are legally required to take back any animal you've sold. If the person says, I can't have it anymore. Mm. So, yeah. you know, it that's a nice the rule. Yeah. Vetting. <laughs> yeah, it brings up the game on vetting who you sell to and what you're selling. Because mm-hmm. if you sell a, a retick to some mouth breathing moron, <laughs> oh sorry, uh, I just slapped my keyboard in. <laughs> um, if you sell if you sell a retick to some idiot, and in three years' time he comes back with a you know massive snake because he's power fed the ever living hell out of it, and you're legally required to take it back. You're mm. like, what am I going to do with this retick? Yeah. You know, you can't dump it because then, you know, A, it's bad. Yeah. You know, you, you're going to kill it. Like, are you a pet shop that's going to just sell it for profit and kill it? Like, you're going to have to rehome it. So then you spend all this effort. How do you house a retick? Because you're only used mm. to housing baby retick. You know, like, yeah. I know I'm using the example of, like, mega snakes, but it changes the game. Like, yeah. even here, so when they did the whole review, again, referencing this wonderful review with all these great ideas that never happened um pet shops were looking at getting everything they wanted yeah. at this point they were going to expand everything because the pet shops are regulated here and they've shown themselves to be good game players and do everything right and it meant that a lot of stuff would get funneled into pet shops that would then be um you know under tighter scrutiny so the regulator could spend more time watching pet shops making sure everything across the community is above board it all just worked out as a great idea but that was on the fact that pet shops had pet shops had shown themselves to be good yeah but there were certain lines in the sand that were discussed that some pet shops were totally against, like olive pythons, you know, for that exact reason. Mm-hmm. You sell an olive python that gets massive, 
I shouldn't say that was all of them. Some definitely still did want to sell olive pythons. Yeah. But you sell an olive pythons, it's probably because of albinos being worth so much here, right? Like mm-hmm. an albino olive in the pet shop would probably retail at the moment for like three to four grand Australian mm-hmm. if someone was actually going to buy it. But, um, you know, it's one of those things where they'd shown themselves to be good. There was a framework in place that they had to play by. And so expanding it to other stuff wasn't going to be as risky. Yeah. You know, while mm-hmm. it feels like in the US, you guys started with an open slather and it's slowly getting whittled away. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great philosophical point to be, a, you know, maybe we shouldn't keep everything or maybe we shouldn't have the availability. I'm sure. not going to start that fight, yeah. but you know what I mean? Like, there should be some some uh, responsibility <laughs> and common sense. And yeah, if you're going to do yeah. it, you should have responsibility for that. I really and, and like I kinda, that aspect of that. Yeah. I kind of question whether the American reptile hobby can work out any other way than the way it's working out now. Just because yeah, of how great. America is, you know, yeah. like I, I just like I, I do I mean, see I do it? see things could changing. It? Could yeah. it? Yes, it could, yeah. and and it does. But why? Yeah. What are the driving factors? It's mainly that are regulation, it to, or you know, yeah, things like and, that. And, but, and it's pe- yeah. because people have been, you know, because we've gone through the aches and pains, and like you know, we we you know we we suffer from the ills. And we ignore it and we allow it to continue and we, oh, you can't take away our rights and we can't. Well, well, and, 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 you know, I think, listen, I get that everybody hates being what t- told what to do. I don't like it either, mm-hmm. but nobody wanted seatbelts when they first said, <laughs> you got to wear a seatbelt in your car yeah. and look how many lives have been saved by wearing seatbelts. Yeah. So not all regulation is bad regulation. Yeah. Now, as we've talked about ad nauseum, you know, there is a lot of bad regulation mm-hmm. out there. And, and, um, I think, but it's usually to, in response to bad practice. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, right, yeah, like it's, yeah. it's rare that well, they it, just going to blanket ban something because, you know, everything's hunky dory. It's usually because something but, happened. Th- yeah. And, and I think that goes <laughs> to why it's even more important for us to have our hands on the wheel mm-hmm. when, when, when this stuff is going on, because, you know, a lot of times a politician just says, well, we have to do something about this. And they're less concerned what the details look like. They leave that up to somebody else. And maybe some idiot, you know, doesn't know what he's talking about. And he's in charge of figuring that out. And he just does something capricious. And the, and the politician can say, well, we solved that problem, didn't we? Mm-hmm. We, we put in legislation yep. to fix this. And, you know, it, it's total garbage in the end. So I, I you know, I, but, but, but in the, but, but I do feel like, you know, we, we should look at, um, you know, and, and hey, listen, you know, my side is that pet shops should be able to have and, and sell what they want. And, and, um, you know, I think even in Australia, they, for, for, you know, at, at, at some degree, they can have and sell what they want as long as they're, they're following the regulations that and and have the proper permits and and that they're doing it right so it it can be done in a successful model um and you know i i think there's you know plenty of examples of aussie keepers keeping stuff that we're kind of like whoa that's crazy that's awesome right like so they're still enjoying themselves they're still so so you know I get it. Nobody likes change. Nobody likes to be told what to do. But, you know, this this all kind of goes back. And I think to the core of this is a welfare, uh, a regulatory, you know, acceptance of, of what's coming to us pro- as Americans, for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, and and, you know, I, I, I mean, I think we can look at some Australian laws and say those are stupid. They don't make any sense. Um, but you can look at others and say, well, I see wh- wh- how they arrived at those things. I see how they got there. Um, I was going to say, like, on that, I think a good example of Australia, like, just on how the rules ended up the way they were and how being reactive um, is a bad way. This is more broadly about just our licensing in general. But Queensland recently, past couple of years, went through a um, uh, license change. So... I would be quite happy in saying publicly that Queensland was probably often regarded as the Germany of Australia (laughs) with everything magically appearing in (laughs) Queensland with legal paperwork and all our wonderful white lip pythons and emerald tree monitors and 
green yeah, tree pythons yeah, in Queensland. New Guinea yeah, green so trees. So it's all magically appeared up there. Mm-hmm. And Queensland got condemned basically mm-hmm. <laughs> by a lot of the regulatory organizations because they'd mm-hmm. allowed this absolute trav oh, I shouldn't say travesty, but like, you know, it was the, the squeaky wheel that had let everything fall apart. Yeah. You know, all this mm-hmm. stuff had made its way into other states and the other states were pissy about it and mm-hmm. um in the end, they went through a rehaul, and you know you could tell from the the process. I remember I was speaking to one of the people at the the Queensland Review, like one of the the herb representatives, and they sent me a document, and it didn't matter. Like you could argue that the person had no idea what they were arguing the in this document, like from the regulator, but the, one of the arguments that just did my head in, which was clear because they just didn't want to allow the point, which was taking animals off licensing. Mm-hmm. Um, they argued that a children's python was harder to keep than a bearded of dragon and less maintenance <laughs> oh, and higher wow. responsibility. <laughs> yeah. And it was just like, <laughs> you know, it, it, you could argue it was ignorance, but it almost came across to me, in my opinion, um, as uh, more of a they just didn't want to allow it to happen. Yeah, yeah. What ended up happening is that Queensland got uh, – we had positive lists. Mm-hmm. Queensland ended up getting a positive list, and the positive list was basically just ripped off New South Wales, so mm-hmm. our positive list down here, with things that they knew were in large numbers in Queensland. Yeah. Now, our positive list is a shit show. It has not been updated properly. It's been ad hoc, added to, changed, subtracted, whatever, the species mm-hmm. over the past 20 years, and it's never actually had a full review re- review in recent times. Mm-hmm. And so there's stuff on the basic license which is not legally around anymore, you know. Yeah. Some of the things that are on our, our open, like, beginner license, the only reason that they were common back in the day is because they're all getting ripped out of the bush, you know. People don't actually breed them in captivity really in good numbers. There are people that breed some of these species, but really they're not they're not suited to captivity. Yeah. And so they're really not around. And that's again, this is pre licensing, early licensing when there was that sort of change over period that it should certainly change now. Um, but it was just like yam, 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 and they just don't breed, they're not easy to keep, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. The stuff on our advanced list that had only just legally come in at the time that it was added onto our advanced list. And they're prolific breeders, you know, two seasons and you've sunk the market. Um, like <laughs> yeah. Varanus King Orm, for example, uh-huh. they are without question, in my opinion, I've kept too many monitor species to admit, <laughs> but Varanus King Orm are one of the best pet monitors that we have in Australia. They're yeah. super outgoing, they're super small, they're suited yeah. to small enclosures. They're really good. When they first came into New South Wales and were licensed and all of that, they were five grand a pair. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're on our advance list. There were a lot of money. There was definitely silly business that went on. Yeah. Um, like with people, you know, laundering them in. That's pretty well yeah. acknowledged um, mm-hmm. that that did happen. Uh, particularly because the, none of the animals in captivity now, which are all many generations captive bred, look anything like the locality they were connected, collected from. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> funny, funny how that is. Uh, like legally collected from when they were, I should say. But you know, yeah. like they they be like however many generations down the line now. That's true. Um. But it's one of those things where there, there's no demand outside of, like, no legal illegal take, like, nothing like that going on. Mm-hmm. Um, but they're still on our advance list because they haven't been moved down. And yeah. they are well-suited, like, really yeah. well-suited to being something that people keep as a first-time pet, say, compared to an Aki. Mm-hmm. Because, yeah. you know, you get good Aki's that handle well, you get... Aki's are pretty, like, they sort of run out, look at you, zip away, like, yeah. all that. King Orem's half the size, half the responsi- well, half the sizing responsibility, yeah. um, and just as active and engaging, and, yeah. you know, handles probably just as well. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and less food, like, there's so much of a better case for them to be a good pet species, yeah. Yeah. but with our slow reactive framework, yeah. they're never going to be there, at least in our state, in the coming future, and it's mm-hmm. such a sad thing to see, yeah. you know? Because they really and, uh, are well suited to being, and this is probably an argument against too much regulation in the pet trade, right? Like, sure. <laughs> it would be better yeah. if they were more around. And they're, they're fecund. They breed like rats. Like, yeah. literally, they just shit eggs out, you know, when you treat them right. Um, yeah. So there's a really good case for why something should be facilitated to becoming a more common pet species rather than, say, um, Tristus. Varanus mm-hmm. Tristus is a really commonly maintained species here. Yeah. They're big. They hide a lot. They hide more than you think. They really hide. They suck. Um, <laughs> you know, like, but people yeah. just love them because they're common. They breed a lot, yeah. um, you know, but they're not a great pet, you know, mm-hmm. like, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah. You know, you get odd individuals, but they're just sooky little animals. So, anyway, I just think there's like a structural change. But the problem is, is again, everyone's got vested interests. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's a tricky Well, and, and I think that's where you get at least the public, you know, the average 
keeper or whatever there that's where they'll push back because they say well once once we accept some kind of legislation and it never changes it doesn't make sense and they don't they don't have their hand on the wheel and it's like you know it doesn't it, 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 i i really think it you know it's it's one of those things where it takes the village to get down the road you know and and mm. i think i think legislators and and regulators have to continue to do their part they just can't put something in place and then walk away from it um, because what you're regulating is a dynamic system uh, it, it, both on the human side and on the, on, on the, uh, the nature side of things. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's not a set it and forget it. Not yeah. in, not in your reptile room, not in regulation, <laughs> not in life. And, ju so. and just because you, you come against a brick wall at, at a certain point, you know, if you want to change the regulations or whatever that, you know, politicians turn over. So down the road, you might have somebody yeah. that, that would listen to your cause. And, and, you know, yeah, like you said, it can be like banging your head against a wall and it's not, you know, a, a fun, a fun job. And so maybe you do take a break and then try again later or, you know, find somebody with a sympathetic ear or whatnot. But and it's yeah. timing, right? So like, yeah. you, exactly the point you make about politicians changing over in that review I was involved with, we had two different government or no, it was the same government got reelected, mm -hmm. but they changed over the minister who oversaw the environmental portfolio. Mm -hmm. And so we went through all these meetings, chatting to the chief of staff of one minister. Yeah. And then as it got close to election, the minister was like, we're not going to do anything, right? Cause it's better to do nothing near an election yeah. Yeah. than do something <laughs> to someone yeah. else. Uh -huh. So it just went all quiet and nothing happened. And then, um, they turfed that minister out because there's a lot of allegations of them being useless, yeah. um, which, you know, I never met with them, but I met with the chief of staff and he was fine. Yeah. Um, and then we met with the next minister's chief of staff and so I had a chat with them mm -hmm. and they were really receptive to the idea and they were really supportive and they thought it was all good and all that sort of stuff. And we had to reestablish the same ground and have the conversation and go again. Yeah. And the problem is, though, and this is, I think, a big issue that comes back to all these points across the whole thing is perspective. Yeah. And that minister was pretty upfront, or that minister's chief of staff was pretty upfront in saying it's a perspective issue. Mm. You know, mm. we, they'd rather not, as you guys have said and heaps of other podcasts say, it's better to do nothing than do something that will piss someone off and turn voters against you. Yeah. And so it's a perspective thing, right? Like if they yeah. do this change and they do it wrong, it's going to get them kicked out and they lose their job. Mm. And like anyone who's going to lose their job, whether it be a mum and dad pet store or a politician, yeah. they're going to fight to make sure that they keep their job because they need to feed their family and live their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's an easy argument for them. Well, I'd like to help you, but if I'm not even in office because I do this, how can I help you? Huh? You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And so it's, you know, and they're smart. Like, you know, there's some dumb ones there. We all <laughs> yeah. acknowledge that. There's definitely some smart, yeah. smart yeah. guys in, yeah. in politics, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. And all hate comes from the fact that they know how to play the game. Yeah. You know, like yeah. it is, you know, it's as much political as it is uh, moral, leading the charge, etc. And there's horse trading, you know, all manner of stuff in politics, but it's as much yeah. a game as anything else. Yeah. And I know that from friends that work as public servants in ministerial offices or have worked as contractors. You know what I mean? Like it's yeah. It's one of those things where you'd be surprised about how much public perspe perspective plays into politics. Oh, and that's 100%. what's happening with reptiles, right? Mm. Like we need to regulate our image and pet shops are a key font. We need to do that through because they are the front line. Mm -hmm. Most people, and I mean, I don't know for the US, but particularly here in Australia, most lay people that aren't part of the hobby, the community, et cetera, their first, first port of call is a pet shop. She can walk into a pet shop. Yeah. You can have a look See at the animals. It. You can have a chat to someone in person. It's the power of a brick and mortar store. Mm -hmm. You know, you mm -hmm. actually feel like you're becoming more educated and getting comfortable. You can handle an animal. You can do all that. And you can argue a good breeder does that too. And this isn't a breeder versus pet store debate, but this is just talking again, that 70%. Yeah. Everything is about that 70%. Yeah. Same thing with the regulation. There are still people today that refuse to wear seatbelts or bicycle helmets. Like we have mm -hmm. legislation here to wear bike helmets. And I saw a dude that got fined for it the other day. And he's like, I shouldn't have to wear one. He's literally screaming out of the cop. Yeah. You know, like <laughs> there are going to be those guys and it doesn't matter. Like yeah. cut them, leave them, forget them. Yeah. We need to be focusing on 
the sudden the entry point and make. managing the perspectives of these people yeah. because without that perspective change and same thing with racking right like we've gone from the era of brian barcheck's videos having fucking water monitors in a rack <laughs> yeah like and he didn't think there was anything uh, wrong with that and i acknowledge he's totally changed his perspective and i think too many people have treated him like shit for too long he's making changes and that's respectful yeah especially with the volume of animals he has mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. and like heaps of people here got into the same situation where they got sold an idea of having 10,000 racks of 10,000 things in whatever size mm-hmm. and they needed to change it, you know, but it takes time. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we need to work on making sure these pet shops, which inform lay people who are ultimately the people that will drive politicians perspectives mm-hmm. are getting sold the right idea. And that comes through making sure that pet shops have, you know, the right species in there, the right attitudes. And, you know, we're talking about large dangerous stuff. There's probably a big case to be made for like, random finicky you know mm-hmm. species that yeah. you know only it's strange stuff we had a really good example here recently in australia um we have a handful of colubrid species mm-hmm. and very few are represented in captivity yeah. so for th- two species three species there's probably like a handful of individuals mm-hmm. um one species which is the brown tree snake there's plenty of individuals sure. and then the other species um the common tree snake mm-hmm. um there's a reasonable amount but they don't breed consistently um, usually someone comes in, does really good with them, breeds a lot of them, releases them, and then over the next five years, everyone else bumbles trying to breed them. Yeah. Um, but they're a finicky species until they get okay. established. Yeah. And so we had a pet shop recently, and because they're, they're pretty, they come in all manner of colors, they're mm-hmm. gold, they're green, they're blue, they're black, and they're like pristine examples of each, like, yeah. you know, bright gold, dark black, hot yellow, bumblebee, whatever the fuck, yeah. you can name it, whatever, but they just got this wonderful natural color palette. They're really highly desirable, but they're frog eaters in the wild primarily. Mm-hmm. They do take to rodents, but they crash fairly hard as well in yeah. captivity if not treated well. Not meant to. And a pet rodents. shop recently put some up fresh out of the egg. The photo was someone holding an egg with the babies coming out of the egg, um, going fresh common tree snakes available, unfeeding, two point two thousand. <laughs> and oh, wow. They got destroyed. The whole community <laughs> turned against them and said, this is irresponsible. Yeah. This is tragic. What are you doing? Yeah. Like, And so the snakes, their retail price for really high-quality yeah. hatchling for the blue, which is probably the most expensive one, are about $1,500, dollars mm-hmm. to $1,500. Mm-hmm. Adults, you probably could get two grand for, but we're talking unfeeding neonates hmm. straight out of the egg for sale in a pet shop. Mm-hmm. For two and like 2.2 thousand. And, you know, it was just such an egregious thing that the whole community, and like, you know, a lay person won't know what that is, but just the fact that that attitude was tried to pull off. Yeah. We need to try and stamp that sort of thing out now because, you know, when it does make its way to a lay person that goes, well, no, it's pretty slack trying to sell something that's going to basically die, you know, like Mm -hmm. (laughs) you sell it to, they said, oh, no, no, we'll exercise caution who we sell it to, but can you really like, Something like that, you'd want well, a high price really, might really competent might do that. You the know? price would yeah. factor in, yeah. But then you do get people that come in, like having worked in the pet shop. Yeah. There are people that have come in that will easily drop five grand in the sale for oh, snakes wow. and tanks, you yeah. know. Yeah, and you know they're, they're yeah. certainly not common, but they're not. Yeah. I'd say they're not probably rare. uncommon to rare. Mm-hmm. Like they they happen. Like there are people. I remember one guy came in and bought an adult albino Darwin and a three thousand dollar setup. You know, mm-hmm. like. And now yeah. I've been a Darwin was worth over a thousand bucks. It would have been, you know, five grand all up easily. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's like cha-ching, cha-ching for the pet shop. But they, you know, spent fucking two and a half, three hours with this guy walking him through everything. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. he was about to spend five grand buying a snack. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yep. And that's a huge, if, if he doesn't know, that's a huge curve to try to talk somebody through. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know. So it's just, um, yeah, I think pet shops, I think they're a wonderful thing, and I, you know, yeah. when they're done right, it's just making sure mm-hmm. that not only the pet shop at its front, but the support behind it being the breeders and people supplying it are done right. You know, yeah. I remember it was a huge blow for the reptile hobby when um, I want to say was it Reptiles by Mac, one of the mm-hmm. big U.S. suppliers of Petco, PetSmart, whatever, had that mm-hmm. Peter team get in behind them and like record all the facilities where they were breeding their bearded dragons and stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, everything was abysmal. You know, they had glue traps down to a catch escapees. Yeah. Like, you know, it was proper criminal. Like, well, mm-hmm. like in Australia, you'd probably get jail time for that, you yeah. know? Yeah. 
Well, I, I don't know what happened with them. And I apologize, I should say, I don't know if it was. I, I can give you a guess. Probably nothing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It would have been, I'd like, I know the US is a lot more lenient, but this is probably part of, like, it comes back to my point, right? You need to self-regulate or mm-hmm. you're going to get screwed. Yeah. And Florida is seeing that. Florida has been playing around for ages. And it started with Tiger King and the big cat bands coming in over there. And it's going to start proliferating into reptiles, you know. And, you know, there's people here, and I don't know what it's like in the U.S., but there are people here that said, we'll give them the low-hanging fruit from us, canned venomous, mm-hmm. you know. And that just pisses the venomous people off, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, and you suddenly isolate that community and there's an argument to be said black market venomous and blah, blah, blah. But, like, you know. I don't know. I just, I think the whole discussion is be proactive, not reactive. Yeah. yeah. And that's, I and mean, that's from the, everything from supply to distribution. Yeah. And that's, that's hard because, you know, you, there's limited funds to fight the fight. And usually you have enough stuff that you have to react to that you don't have a lot left over to mm. be proactive. And so I think it, it, it boils down to the keeper, you know, you're, your money is what's funding these things. If there's a pet store you walk into and it's garbage, walk out. Don't spend any money yes. with them, even if you're desperate to get crickets or you know whatever. Like, you know, your your money talks, and that's what's going to keep keep this thing going or or potentially shut it down. So if you're supporting um, unscrupulous people, now we're we're probably preaching to the choir because anybody listening to this yeah. probably keeps you know mm-hmm. and 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 understands that's, these. That's things what I was and, going through you know, my head right yeah. now. It's like the people who yeah. are going in there are not, yeah. you know, they're not willfully ignorant. Yeah. they're yeah. you know they're they just, just don't know normal like ignorant. And and it's the I local pet exactly shop. Normal right. ignorant. Yeah, they're that's not going right. to drive. That's you know. true. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The person I got my first lizards off, I. Yeah, I Googled where do I buy lizards where I live, and that was the person that came up as the first hit. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I bought them off them and thought I was doing everything right and, you know, went back the next week and bought more lizards because that's what they said was totally fine and good to do <laughs> and set up shit out setups for all of them and had some die. And, you know, yeah. that was the idea I was sold. I was sold mm-hmm. the dream of, oh, yeah, it's easy to have as many lizards as I have. Mm-hmm. Um, so come back next week with your next paycheck and buy another lizard. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that's been a part of the hobby too, is this, it's fine to have 10,000 snakes, you know, and that's a different discussion as well. But yeah. Yeah. I, and I guess, well, no, people probably know who I'm implying in Australia because it's pretty obvious who this person is, but you know, they're pretty, their operation is somewhat condemned. They, you know, some people love them, some people hate them, but they skirt the line between a pet shop and a private breeder. Mm-hmm. And they've certainly been in all manner of, debates and debacles between that but in skirting that line they've been able to avoid the legislation that restricts pet shops here because they're just a private breeder but they operate in the same fashion that a pet shop would and so they've been able to sort of cheat the system in many ways um whether you again love them or hate them i'm not passing judgment on this particular person per se Mm -hmm. but um it just shows like you know they retail a hell of a lot more animals than other places like they just flog them out the door to whoever will pay, yeah, you know, and I don't think anyone could argue otherwise. Like, it's pretty well known what they do, and that they're happy to sell anything as long as you, you know, meet the requirements. They'll sell you anything, you know, anything they've got. That is, yeah. So, and you know, you take a tank and a setup, and you come back the next week because your lizard died, and they tell you, oh, it's because you didn't do this, and you buy another lizard, mm-hmm. and that's the money making operation. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> just a, an example of like what happens when you can skirt around the regulation here, you know, while all the mm-hmm. other pet shops are again tightly regulated and there's a lot more control over what they do and how they distribute it. So, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I, I, no, I, okay. I there, there's <laughs> the dogs barking. I was wondering what yeah. you were doing. <laughs> um, <laughs> we, I think, um, you know, the, a lot of great points made, you know, I think this is a really productive uh, discussion and, you know, of course the, the solutions are, are, you know, mixed and, and difficult to achieve. But I think, you know, as long as we're thinking as, you know, collectively and trying to educate others at, at you know, reptile shows or through social media or whatever, uh, as long as we're doing our part, you know, I think we can feel good about our efforts and, you know, like being proactive and trying to give people the resources they need to succeed and, I mean, I, I think, like you said, you know, we've all been there, that first you know, reptile and, and mm, you know, yeah. a, a lot of times it doesn't end well, but, you know, we've, we've grown and we've learned from that. And, and unfortunately, you know, that's, that's one thing that, that bothers me a lot is, you know, the animals that I'm putting out there, 
uh, you know, how, how many of those are being used to learn, but at the same time, uh, you know, that's kind of a valuable thing. I guess they may be a snack for a, a hawk in the wild. You know, it's, it's, it kinda, yeah. uh, I, mean, I don't know. We, you know, it's, it's valuable to be yeah. you, right? Yeah. Like I, I think, and this, you can only like, and I shouldn't say I'm expecting the world of everyone, even with pet mm-hmm. shops, right? You can only do so much due diligence, sure. yeah. yeah. but the standard of due diligence, I think varies considerably in what people yeah. view as yeah. good. You know, like in Australia, some people view the fact you have a license as you do diligence. Some people won't, they'll just sell you fucking anything. Like, yeah. you know, yeah. like, and then there's other people like myself where I genuinely, I go show us a photo of your setup. I'll have a phone call with them now. Cause generally speaking, if they're happy to be on the phone, you know, it's not just some idiot that's called like sending a message being like, how much is it? You know, like yeah. you do due diligence, you have a conversation, you ask them about like, for a lot of the lizards I like sell or have sold, I'm like, what sort of UV do you have? Like, what's the brand? All that sort of stuff. Like, because mm-hmm. still we have people here buying cheap, unbranded crap that just dies after a week. And I'm like, oh no, go for this, for this, or yeah. this type of UV you should be fine with. You know, like there's different degrees. And when you start investing more per individual, that's more time and less profit for you. Yeah. And that's where I think a lot of people that have, and again, pet shops, it doesn't matter. It's their day job, right? Yeah. They rock up in the They're morning and they can invest that time into that person. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, for everyone else, as you sort of said before, unless you're a professional breeder, if you're doing it on the side, that's time out of your downtime. You know, you work your nine to five mm-hmm. and then you spend time trying to convince someone to buy your stuff or you take a break and work, you know, yeah. or yeah. whatever. Like it eats into other things and other time points. And yeah. so when you're breeding that volume and trying to flog it off and not investing as much time, you just go bam, 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 bam. But you need to increase your due diligence, I guess is what I'm getting at. Anyway. Yeah. Yep. Well, I think I think we've broken a record with this one. We've we've passed the two hour mark, which is you know it's been. Uh, mm, I told you, chat. <laughs> <laughs> That's hey, you, you gave us fair warning, and but it's been all good. So you know, I I, yeah. I can't complain about that at all. So thank you for uh, new ground, but yeah. fertile ground yeah. nonetheless. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, um, you know, that's, that's been a good fight. Hopefully you guys learned some stuff and can take some things into consideration and maybe change a perspective here or there. But, um, I don't know any, any, uh, new things you've, you've discovered in the reptile world or, or exciting things uh, in the U S today is national rattlesnake day. So happy rattlesnake day, everybody. And <laughs> go out and I don't, I don't think you can go out and see a rattlesnake in too many places in the U S right now, but, uh, they're probably down for the winter, but, um, hopefully you're buzzing and day. muzzing nonetheless <laughs> buzz and muzz away <laughs> um travis wyman sent me a, a link to a show it's called the anthropocene podcast and they were talking about diet dr pepper so i learned a little bit about my uh, favorite what drink the heck? and the pepper is not for the flavor it's it's for pep like you know so there, there you ah, go. There's, so there's it, my herping so, fuel is, uh, so you, aptly knew, this, you knew all this very intuitively. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Huh. So, all right. Well done, doctor. Well done. And then I, I got a couple new books, so I'm kind of excited about it. I just broke into one of them, uh, hunters in the trees and natural history of arboreal snakes. There was a bunch of like cheap books on Amazon. So I'm like, Oh, can yeah. you move it over so I can oh, see the cover here? Yeah. Um, Seems, oh, nice. So it's I, who's the author? It's uh, Richard A. Sag Sagdak. I'm not sure how to Sajdak? pronounce that, but yeah, Sadak, Sadak, something like that. Sadak, Sadak. And yeah. then I just sounds got good. a. That I, sounds like me pronouncing Latin names right yeah. there. Just a, a guidebook to the uh, Madagascar re- amphibians and reptiles of Madagascar. You know, I don't know. Nice. I saw. Uh, well, Dave Kaufman went over there, so I'm excited to see kind of some of his videos. I, I, li- I like his videos. I think he does a good job, mm-hmm. and, and especially where he's traveling throughout the world, showing us them in their natural habitat. Really cool stuff. So, And some of the, the things he was doing regarding, like, here's their temperatures and here's, you know, wh- what kind of soil they're on and things like that. I think that's mm-hmm. very helpful. So I applaud his, his efforts. You know, I, I know some people have maybe a different attitude about him, but I, I think he's doing a good job educating people and showing us the cool wildlife out there. So I don't know. That's kind I of, I was going to say, I really like Dave's stuff too, but mm-hmm. the, I wouldn't say it's a criticism. It's just, yeah. The one thing I would say about particularly the temperatures and mm-hmm. those, they're all snapshots and people yeah. need to understand mm-hmm. their snapshots, right? Like yeah. you can't say, well, I've seen people and this isn't what he's done. This isn't about his videos. It's how people have interpreted it. Sure. Yes. They go, this is exactly how it always is now. You know, yeah. and it's like, yeah. this is just a single example of uh, you know one or two species. You know, we mm-hmm. talk about in science, you know, N of one, right? Like yeah. you, you can't yeah. say anything on an N of one, Yeah, but 
if you have a good sample size and you see consistent patterns, you can say about this population of X or this, yeah. you know, this whole species because we've looked across the whole range of X or yeah. whatever. Anyway, yeah. sorry, I don't mean to tangent, but I just no, no, I know awesome that's good. That's a good. <laughs> yeah. You can't be adamant about it. Yeah, it? no, I, I I appreciate that because I I you know you, you're right. It is a snapshot, and I I guess you know and and herping kind of clears things up a little bit too, because I always thought, you know, rainforest, you go into a rainforest, it's hot, it's muggy, it's, you know, 90, 100 degrees with 100% humidity. I went up into Iron Range in the rainforest and walk around and it's like 70. And then I get looking on, you know, on the different apps and looking at temperatures, you know, averages, minimums, maximums, and like pretty much it's always, you know, 70 degrees or always 70 to 80 degrees, you know, and that's pretty much the, the way they live. And and then I look at their keeping and they're keeping them at 90 degrees and feeding them rats. And I'm like, this is an arboreal python. I'm like, why are you feeding it large? You know, and, and the recommendations to have them over a thousand grams to breed and stuff. I'm like, this is a lot of misinformation. You know, let's change that. So kind of the impetus for writing that green tree python book. But, you know, just you're right. Don't take a, a, a snapshot in time as what they do all the time. You know, because that varies mm. what they eat, you know, how much heat they're taking in or or avoiding, you know, that can all vary uh, depending on the time of year. Yeah. Exactly. It's like, you know, it's building a case, I guess, for certain arguments. And there's some, you know, it's a pity for some of these natural history papers, particularly, I think, Australian species that are behind, like, the, the scientific paywall because mm -hmm. they really are such informative things yeah. for people that want to keep them, you know. Right. Like, there's papers on the ecology and, you know, microhabitat use, like, yeah. Daniel Latouche, for instance, has done a heap on all the tropical pythons, like mm -hmm. radio tracking them and all that, beyond just green trees. Yeah. You know, he's yeah. done, like, uh, King Ornai and, yeah. or um, Somalia. Yeah, yeah, exactly, you know. So there's a huge case to be made about the benefit of people seeing that and understanding, you yeah. know, how it can inform their keeping. Yeah. Um, but that's because he's got, you know, X sample size. He's looked at a whole heap of yeah. individuals and he can compare patterns mm -hmm. versus just one animal. I was thinking um, about that the other day because a lot of people go and do uh, – field work when they don't have classes, you know? And so a lot of times that, that coincides with the summer from like June to, you know, August and, and a lot of, a lot of reptiles, especially in the deserts of the Southwest where I live are, are the reptiles are not very active, you know, except maybe nocturnally. So if you looked at that snapshot, you'd think, Oh, everything's nocturnal. And you know, they love this high heat and all that kind of stuff where they're, they're doing everything they can to avoid that high heat or, or, you know, that kind of thing. So, you know, it just, it, it, when these studies are done is important too. And I, I really liked, uh, mm -hmm. that aspect of, uh, Shine's book where he talked about going into the um, the museums and having the, this huge amount of, of animals that have been collected over time and, and could look at, you know, trends and, you know, what they were doing or what they were eating at certain times of the year. And I thought that was pretty and cool. And I mean, like, those, like, Rick's Alapid papers, the museum papers, yeah. are, like, foundational to so much of what, like, yeah. you know, that's where he really yeah. built his his like stronghold on Australian lapids at the time, right? Because we knew nothing. Yeah. We knew absolutely <laughs> exactly. nothing. And, 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 and to, so, to build or to, to make hypotheses, you have to know something. You have to have a, a base layer, you know, to build on that. And so he did a great job of putting in that base layer. Yeah. That foundation. And yeah, like I've got a paper we're finishing up at the moment looking at um, how a, a lapid responded to the bushfires, like the, mm -hmm. um, you know, the massive bushfires we had here. Yeah. And literally there's only two papers on that elapid. There's one by Rick and a natural history note from someone who caught one and got babies out of it. Oh, you know? <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. You know, like, uh -huh. this is, again, you know, 20 years ago when yeah. you could do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And they're like, oh, the mother was this long, the neonates were this long, you know, things yeah. like that. Yeah. But, you know, there's so many things we don't have this knowledge on. But the fact that Rick had this broad ecology paper mm -hmm. allowed us to say a lot more things in this paper because we go, oh, well, you know, they eat this and, you know, mm -hmm. maybe there was more of this species of skink that we're all, you know, we observe more of this species of skink in that area, yeah. this, that, that, you know what I mean? Like you can actually make these better calls and that's about building yeah. on this knowledge base. It's the whole point of science, right? On yeah. the shoulders of giants, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, there is a, uh, you need fundamental knowledge to be able to generate hypothesis and build understanding. Yeah. That's awesome. Yep. So I, 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 I neglected to ask you, but I, I wanted to, I had it in my head, but I just never got around to it. But what, what spe what group of lizards do you enjoy the most or what kind of are you known for keeping? Uh, so 
I guess historically my main one was the gametes, mm-hmm. so I kept a lot of the Australian gametes. So mm-hmm. primarily the Tenophorus genus, which okay. is our sort of yeah. most one of our most diverse, along with Diperifera. Yeah. Um, so I used to keep yeah too many of them, <laughs> too many <laughs> yeah. Tenophorus species. Uh-huh. You know, I, I, I'll be quite honest in saying I got into like the collector mindset, where it's like another one mm-hmm. in the in the house. Yeah. Um, and there's certainly certain species that I really do want again. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I mean, a different discussion for another point is about the, uh, I very much got into the mindset and I've reflected on it a lot, but where this species might go extinct in captivity. And sure. so I needed to keep it and breed it and perpetuate it. Yeah. And everyone that I know that's ever done that with uncommon species has always had like very bad experiences because the reason it's uncommon is because no one wants it. Yeah. And so you put your heart and soul into breeding and proliferating it. Yeah. And, and then you struggle to find good homes yeah. and you're sitting. Yeah. yeah. And so it's just, a, it's, it's one of those things that maybe there are certain things that you shouldn't. And this is again, that philosophical question, right? right? Like if you're constantly fighting to keep it in captivity anyway. Um, but that's what I used to keep a lot of. And I still have like quite a few species and are quite yeah. passionate about them. What's um, one of the, what's yeah, one of your favorites or one of the most, I guess, Best so for, of the gametes, yeah. my favorite's probably the central nether, yeah. um, which is the most common one. <laughs> they are so uh, cool. Which I found out uh, in the U.S. now. At, yeah. So yeah, they're, they're regarded as a trash lizard some. here. Uh-huh. Um, but over there, like the ones I saw that someone sent me a link to it on an uh, importer's website, but there was 1700 U.S., I think, or something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, here they're like a hundred dollars. Yeah. Um, <laughs> exactly. Um, but like, uh, yeah. so Nucalis is definitely one of my favorites. Yeah. I also really like Pictus, Tenophorus Pictus. Mm-hmm. They're really wonderful lizards. Okay. Um, but at the moment, probably my favorite lizard is the Western Blue Tongue. Oh, so okay. I've got a few Western yeah, Blue Tongues. I love Western Blue Tongue. I quite love them. They're so cool. Yeah. So, um, they're like my little passion project. And then with snakes, brown tree snakes, uh, like my other big passion. Yeah passion project and so but yeah i went through a downsize just with work life and um mm. uh particularly yeah mainly work like trying to main you know i was in the very unhealthy state of getting home and spending hours you know getting home in the afternoon and spending four hours every night cleaning feed or no yep. feed in the morning like get up early feed everything yeah. get home in the evening change waters all that sort of stuff and you know i barely had a life and yeah. all the money so <laughs> the smart reduction move and yeah. yeah but i still love all the species i kept and you know yeah. There's so many wonderful things you can do and enjoy, but you can't have them all. And that's something everyone needs to understand. <laughs> yeah, for yeah. sure. Well, cool. Um, anything else? Uh, I think this has been a really great show and thanks again for coming on and we'll have to have you back again. So any other ideas, shoot yeah. them our way. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you yeah. for having me and make sure for the next show to plan out at least three out now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. Where, where can people find you? Where, where, what's your, uh, you know, social media uh, I mean, I do, I do have Facebook, but, mm-hmm. um, I probably like, I'm, I'll be honest. I've, I really don't reply to people. Yeah. I, you know, for ages, I, I get burnt out dealing with Slack, uh, Slack buyers when I try to sell stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. so, you know, I'm very much in the, the herp, herp scenes where I just talk to my like reptile keeping friends, my herping yeah. friends and like, you know, extended networks and stuff. Sure. So feel free to extend a line and I'll try to reply to you, but I'll be honest <laughs> that I just, I'm pretty shocking. So, but yeah, Mitchell, Mitchell Hudson. So, all right. <laughs> well, we'll, uh, fo- follow you, on, you know, from afar, I guess. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All, right. all right. Well, don't call me. I'll call you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah pretty much. I know that's the most asshole thing to say. <laughs> no, but, uh, no, 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 no. No. Yeah. On my part, Cause yeah. I just have so many people that message me and I just, I, you know, I'm running around like a headless chicken at work. Like, so yeah. on top of my private animals, I've got, <laughs> Uh-huh. A lot of animals at work, which I won't say the number, but a lot there that I'm dealing with. So yeah. I have a lot to balance. <laughs> yeah. Understood. No. Understood. You yeah. do not have to explain it to yep. either of us. Yep. All right. <laughs> All right. And uh, B, you can check me out at uh, AustralianDiction.com. I don't update it as much as I'd like and or as I should, but uh, yeah, you can see stuff I work with there at least. And, and on the social media is uh, JG Julander on uh, Instagram and then Justin Julander. Uh, on Facebook. So Chuck, you, yeah. Um, you can find me on Instagram at Chuck Norris wins. Um, it's a bit of a hodgepodge of my life and my reptiles. So don't be shocked when it's not just, uh, just pictures of snakes (laughs) and stuff, but, uh, yeah, I'm on Facebook, Chuck Poland, but it's really kind of my personal account. Like, you know, I don't, I don't even post on Facebook that much anymore. So yeah, I'm pretty lame. So. 
Oh, I guess we got a group of lame guys here today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The lames. <laughs> well, hopefully you enjoyed listening to this because that's all you're getting from us. No. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> all right. Well, well, shout out to NPR uh, Network and check out you know, Morelli Python's uh, radio on uh, all their social media and websites and all that good stuff. And thanks again to them for hosting us. And uh, we'll catch you again next week for another edition of Reptile Fight Club. I don't want to have to smack your bum. Join us next week for fu- for more Reptile Fight Club fun. Fight Club.